Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Alive, the blogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. <laughs> well, tonight on Tales from SYL Ranch, we have a DC superhero anniversary and kind of a big one at that. And we also have the Fandai Masters 60th Anniversary Review of uh, The Revenge of Frankenstein. Maybe a little bit shorter tonight because there's a bit of context that I'm not going to go into because I went into it in some depth in previous weeks. But to explain the show for people who may not be showing up right on the hour or for those of you who are watching new from the archives i do live reviews sometimes i do serious films and tv sometimes i do schlock just for the kicks of it and sometimes i review modern films that have some kind of broad appeal like star wars movies marvel movies doctor who star trek discovery the orville Usually, however, I stick to a period of about 1900 to 1990, and that's because the period after this is pretty well documented. We had a lot of science fiction that came after it, and a lot of great technology that allows us to document all this stuff. But the period from 1900 to 1980 contains a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that is not documented. And so part of the reason that I do this show is to document it. I will take any and all questions, comments, and nasty remarks, and I will respond to my, as many of my viewers as possible. I, you can tell me if I'm missing something, if I'm just completely full of crap, or if I'm amazingly awesome, which is far more likely. I also go into more depth than most reviewers. I don't just say whether I like something or not or particular moments I like. I talk about acting, direction, cinematography, some of the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this to some extent because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor. And so I can speak with some authority. Not as much as a modern working actor. I never want to give anybody that impression, but with some authority. As they often say, those who can and do and those who can't teach. And I imagine that doing reviews is along about those same areas. Hey, Larry Larry, Village of pick Pitchforks. Yes, for some reason in Frankenstein movies, people tend to have pitchforks. Not so much in this one, but uh, this is a very different movie from that perspective, so it's kind of cool. So today's superhero anniversary, just so you know where I get these from. In 1972, DC Comics published a list of superhero anniversaries and birth dates. Not necessarily superheroes, but anybody involved with their multiverse at that time. Um, it may no longer be accurate. This is all what we call pre-crisis, but uh, hey, I don't care. I'm using them anyway. So today, our DC superhero anniversary, anniversary rather, is Pete Ross. Now, here we can see Pete actually talking uh, to Superboy. Um, actually, Clark Kent dressed as Superboy. Go figure that one. Uh, this all happened pre-crisis. Now, I've got a whole video out there called Crisis on Infinite Earths, how DC Comics became permanent chaos. And you can find a link to that video down below. Um, long story short, pre-crisis, DC had a fairly robust, well-fleshed out multiverse that extended from the Westerns era, the 1880s, all the way through to modern times at that point, 1985. Then DC decided, uh, this is too much complicated. We can't keep doing stuff on this. Our readers are getting confused idiots. We understood perfectly fine. So they came up with Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was a 12-issue maxi-series that involved as many as humanly possible people from their, uh, you know, various uh, places in history and various alternate universes and all the titles that were running then. And they squashed all the universes down to a single one. Now, I can talk, as I say, I have a video out there where I talk about this in some detail. I would definitely go out and take a look at that. It goes into a lot more detail about just exactly what they fracked up and what they did badly and how it all turned out for the worse on the other side of it. One of the things they do did uh, at that point and, and became a very popular term I'm going to talk about in a minute. So this all happened pre-crisis. This was at a time when Superboy was, Superman had started his career as a teenager under the name Superboy. And he had, uh, you know, people he fought, he had friends. And one of these friends was teenager uh, Pete Ross, whom, again, we see here. He moved to Smallville, became friends with Clark, and they were both teenagers at the time. But then one night on a camping trip, uh, Clark had to change to Superboy, and a, a uh, bolt of lightning flash saw, allowed him to actually see Superboy, uh, Clark changing to him. But Pete did keep this secret for a long time. He didn't tell Superboy about it 
Um, sometimes he helped Superboy out by doing that. Um, he would, uh, you know, come up with um, generally Silver Age kind of, you know, silly excuses for why Clark wasn't around and Superboy was and stuff. But he was essentially a confederate of Superboys uh, for a long period of time. In fact, into uh, his adulthood. Then something bad happened. And this was pre-crisis, so, uh, you know, get that they can sometimes go dark with these characters when they start to get um, a little bit desperate. And they sort of were here, I think. Uh, what we're seeing here is Pete Ross as an adult. He's the blonde guy um, from Superman number 173. Uh, Pete was by then a widower who had a son named Jonathan, uh, apparently named after uh, Clark Kent's father. And his son was kidnapped by aliens. And Peach, he went to Clark, told him he knew the secret, and said, you got to go save my kid. But Superman was unable to rescue him. And this was because the aliens knew that in the future this kid was going to have a pivotal role in bringing about an era of peace throughout the entire universe. So Superman explained this to Pete. Pete could not cope and essentially turned into a bad guy for a while. Um, he, uh, this is the weird bard. He used a device that belonged to Lex Luthor to make it so that they could have a crossover with the Silver Age Superboy. So we have Superman, grown Superman on the one hand, and then this crossover with uh, his, himself as a, as a teenager. Um, they used to do that from time to time. They'd say, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could get Superman and Superboy together? It's why in the modern age, Superboy is an entirely different character because they don't have to kill themselves to get a guest with Superboy. But back then they did, and this was how they were going to do it with uh, Pete Ross um, having uh, essentially saying to uh, Clark, uh, you know, I'm going to get somebody here who can fight you. Uh, it all works out, but if, uh, in the end, Superman is able to uh, rescue Pete's uh, son, Jonathan, and uh, everything works out. That was all pre-crisis. Now, post-crisis never happened. Um, Superman started as an adult in costume, not as a teenager. And so, therefore, if, if Pete Ross exists anymore at all now, the last I knew he was an extremely minor character. It wasn't that big a deal anymore. My understanding is that he appeared in the first three seasons of Smallville. However, I did not see enough of that show to know. Uh, for me, the interesting part of uh, Superman is when he's Superman and doing all kinds of super things. Uh, Smallville was much more like a lot of TV series are, a more character-driven thing. wasn't my cup of tea specifically, but it was a good show. I understood that. So that was our superhero anniversary for the week. Pete Ross discovers that Superboy is Clark Kent. So, about the film. Now, setting the context. I kicked around for a long time when I was going to spend a whole bunch of time going through context exactly like I did last week, and then a huge chunk of context that I did for the blob. I usually like to say to people, I'm going to give you this stuff outright and not cause you to have to go back and watch something. In this particular case, <laughs> go back and watch something. I don't want to sit here and go over the exact same thing over again for the third time. I have two videos out there, one where I talk about the world of 1957 that was uh, pulled out as a clip last week, and then another one where I talk very specifically about drive-in movie theaters. I suggest you go and watch those videos. Um, they will put a lot more context into this. Half a second. My chair was sliding down rather annoyingly. Um, but go back and watch that stuff. It'll give you more context, and I'm not going to sit here and go through it in great detail like I did. The main thing that you have to be aware of is, in 1957, it was not socially acceptable for dates to have too terribly much physical contact on, except under certain circumstances, and scary movies were one of them. Uh, in a theater, a scary movie would allow a woman to pretend to be overcome with fear, and with a man to pretend to be able to comfort her, thus allowing a, a lot more physical contact, not necessarily kissing, sucking face, or making out, but, uh, you know, cuddling and things like that. That was in a theater. Then we have this film, which almost certainly would have been drive-in movie theater fare. Uh, drive-in movie theaters, again, not going to it in huge detail, but it was an outdoor theater. It had a big, giant parking lot with the front of it had a big screen, and they would play the movies on the screen. And there were usually two films, and there was in this case, I've forgotten what the second feature was, but there was an A movie and a B movie. 
And the thing about drive-in movie theaters was it was a huge technological advancement on a number of levels, but the biggest thing was sociological because it allowed teenagers to get out of this restricted area in a theater where they were expected to behave a certain way and more into a certain level of privacy where they were able to make out and all kinds of stuff that they couldn't do in a theater. Um, big deal, it's sociologically, bigger deal than you think. Um, the, the, it probably led more or less directly to some of the sociological stuff that we see today. Particularly when it comes to the teenagers and the like. So it was, um, it was a big deal. Uh, I would say certainly that, uh, as I pointed out in the past, when I've talked about driving through movie theaters in my own experience, by the time the 80s, 70s or 80s rolled around, when I was, uh, you know, first to dating and uh, they were driving movie theaters, it was damn near an excuse to have sex. Um, if a guy and a girl went on a date, you know, there was some good chance that sex was going to be involved. Uh, there was always a the saying associated with uh, drive-in movie theaters. If the car is a rockin', don't come a knockin'. And uh, certainly it was worse if the windows were all fogged. Um, but that was one of the big deals there. Now, drive-in movie theaters, of course, are pretty much dead. Um, there are some still out there, and if you have the, ex uh, the chance to go see something, and it's not, uh, if it's a good movie, because they do first-run movies at these sometimes, uh, I definitely suggest going and seeing it, just for the experience, just so you can you know, see what it's like to watch a movie from your car. And even if you're older, if you've got kids, you can take your kids with you. Um, they oftentimes will have a play area down in the front. They will usually have a couple of three picnic tables. You can watch the movie from right under the screen if you want to. Um, but they're mostly dead now, and they're dead largely because of home video, where drive-in movies were an advancement forward in technology that put you into the comfort of your own car, well, home video put the comfort right into your living room. Plus, you didn't have to go out and buy tickets or buy it at a specific time. You could just rent the video and watch it whenever you felt like watching it. Um, so that pretty well killed the drive-in movie theater. Um, you don't see them much today. There were three of them in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I currently am. At the time, that was a city of about 150,000. It still supported three of these things. Uh, they're all gone now, every last one. My understanding is that there may be one still over in Omaha, um, which is about 45 miles from here, but I haven't gone to see it. I probably should sometime. Um, I have a special place in my heart for drive-in movie theaters because of my uh, youth. But in any case, if you have the chance, go to an outdoor drive-in movie theater because I think you'll enjoy the experience. Not something you'll do every weekend necessarily, but something you can say, hey, I, it was kind of fun. I went and did that. Um, I think... One of the last times I went out to see a drive-in movie, I think it was the, the A feature, the first movie, because they usually have two. And the first one used to be called the A movie, and the second one, the B movie. And that's where we get our term, B movie, because those B movies, the second one, not necessarily as high budget as the first one. Uh, again, I've forgotten what they sent this one out on, but the, they're usually trash that I don't even want to review. <laughs> Um, but uh, it was just called a B-movie because it was second. Maybe it wasn't as good as the first one, especially in drive-in movie theaters because it was so late. You couldn't start the film until dusk, at least, um, oftentimes 9 p.m. when it first started. So by the time you get finished with your A-movie, it's like 11 or something. Not everybody's going to stick around for the second one. Sometimes people leave partway through because it's getting late. Um, but that's why they called it a B-movie. It came second. Uh, today, when we talk about a B-movie, it's really any kind of crappy movie. Um, but back then, it was had a specific meaning. It was the second movie when that, that ran. So, that is more or less the context that you have to keep in mind here. Um, people could not have the kind of uh, physical contact on a date that's just normal now. And this helped some of that happen. People were able to get more physical contact because of that. And drive-in movie theaters were very big with teenagers as a consequence. Larry Larry says, events in a park are done outside with a film shown on a building wall sometimes. Yeah, yeah, they do do that sometimes. Um, like I said, the last one I think I went to was actually first run. It was Escape from L.A. Um, that's a movie I actually like better than Escape from New York. I'm in a very minority about that. Uh, but yes, they do still sometimes have outdoor events when they do this sort of thing. Uh, I recall... One of the last times I went to a convention, a, a, a fan-run convention in Michigan, um, they had, among other things, sci-fi dive-in theater. 
um, which they showed, uh, I think it was Creature from Black Lagoon when I was there, on a very large screen right above the hotel pool, um, which was kind of fun. But yes, Larry, Larry, they do sometimes do these things uh, outside with the film shown on a building wall. Uh, it's certainly possible to do that as long as the building wall is uh, light enough. Um, a lot of times, drive-in movie theater screens were just painted white. Um, if it was a more upscale one, it could have a support structure and, you know, a screen that was really like a screen made for that purpose. But yep, as long as it's light, you can certainly do that. And I enjoy going to those things as well, though not quite as much as uh, drive-ins. Drive-ins just have a special place in my heart because of where they were when I was uh, first dating and stuff. So that's the context. Just keep in mind, we're watching, uh, when you're watching this, you are watching what would have been at the time probably drive-in movie theater fair that, again, allowed a woman or a girl, teenager, to pretend to be really scared and a man to pretend that he was consoling her, which got them together to some extent. Uh, you know, scary movies like this guy's just lived for. <laughs> um, especially in drive-ins, you could, uh, you know, figure you were going to get some make-out time. One other thing about drive-ins is back at the t back in the day they were so popular with teenagers. A lot of times, if you went to a movie with your date, like five guys who didn't have dates would show up at the drive-in and try to find your car, uh, either to bug you, catch you in the act, or otherwise kind of embarrass you with what's going on. So that was happening. My non-spoiler review for this film. Um, this is a pretty good sequel. I was a little surprised. Now, I, I, as a fan die master, I am ashamed to admit it, but most of the Hammer horror films I have never watched all the way through. I have watched bits and pieces of them over the years, but I've never seen the whole things. So in this particular case, you're dealing with a movie that I did not see prior to my having reviewed it. Um, it is very unusual in terms of a Frankenstein film. Most Frankenstein films just rehash either pieces of the last movie or previous movies, or they rehash chunks of the Frankenstein novel that no one has really touched. This one's totally different. This is the first time that Mary Shelley is not credited for the original story on this, and that's unusual. She almost always is. Um, but that's because it really is its own story. Uh, I was a little surprised by it. It very much uh, deviates from some of the Frankenstein stuff that we've seen. And for me, not having watched it um, and, and having seen a million Frankenstein movies, the twist at the end was actually a bit of a surprise to me, which doesn't happen that often. Uh, again, I hadn't seen this one. Most of the time, uh, that sort of ending you didn't see. Um, I'll talk about that more when I get into the spoiler part of the review. Um, I would definitely say do not watch the next film uh, that Hammer put out with Frankenstein. It is The Evil of Frankenstein, and it sucks on so many levels. I will talk about that a little bit as I get in here. So at this point, I can issue me a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that very rarely, occasionally, you can surprise me, but usually nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about half an hour early. And it's not a boast, it's not a brag, this is unfortunately where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see all the new stuff for the entire century that came before, and it oftentimes inhibits your ability to enjoy, enjoy things. But this one was a little bit different because it was its own story and because I did not see the ending coming. I uh, was a little bit surprised. So good on you, Hammer. Uh, if I'd seen this in 1958 or any other time in my life, I'm sure I would have been surprised by that ending. It is a different story than a lot of Frankenstein movies, and so that's kind of nice. So to walk through the plot of the Revenge of Frankenstein. It is the year 1860, and Baron Victor von Frankenstein is sentenced to death, as we saw in the last film. This film takes up instantly where the last one left off, um, when they're about to lead Frankenstein away to the guillotine. But he escapes um, via reasons that I'll talk about in a minute, which kind of suck. Um, but in his place has a priest that was accompanying him to the gallows, killed and put in the guillotine instead. There's, there's an interesting moment. I didn't see it coming. 
Um, you know, I was thinking, all right, how are they going to do this? He, he went to the, he went to, he was headed, he was literally being, walking off to the guillotine. How are they going to get him out of this? And um, they show the, uh, uh, half a second, I'm going to have to cough. Excuse me. They show the guillotine. You see a little, hear a little bit of a struggle in the background, but you assume as a viewer, oh, that's just Frankenstein not wanting to go to his death. It isn't something you think about very hard. And then you see the guillotine come down. And of course, they had to do that because no way back then were they going to shoot, shoot, uh, film anybody getting their head cut off. That weren't happening. Um, so as a viewer, you're like, okay, where's this going? And then it's three years later. And Frankenstein is alive, and he's going by the name of Dr. Victor Stein. And he has become a physician in the towns of, uh, uh, German town of uh, Carlsbruck, where he caters to wealthy patients. Uh, the woman we see uh, mostly is a woman named Margaret, whose mother is convinced that her daughter has some serious problem that Frankenstein is not treating. I think her mother's a hypochondriac. Um, sort of on behalf of her daughter, which is a little bit weird, but a hypochondriac on the behalf of her daughter. Um, and he also, he caters to the wealthy, but he also spends a lot of time working for the poor in a pauper's hospital, which is kind of unusual. You didn't necessarily see an upscale doctor doing that at that time. Uh, I'll talk about the production design on that a little bit, but I found that kind of impressive, to be honest. Hans Cleve, who is a junior member of the Medical Council, now, he's, Frankenstein's been operating outside of, he's not joined the medical council. And this is for them sort of like, hey, wait a minute, you should be joining this. They send some people around to get him to join, but they're put off by the fact that he, he meets them not in any place nice, but in this charity hospital ward, which is pretty awful. Um, they go away, but Hans Cleve, who is a junior member, younger than Frankenstein by a good number of years, recognizes Frankenstein and then blackmails him into allowing Cleve to become Frankenstein's apprentice. Um, again, this is one of those deals like where I'll talk about it when I get to the when I get to the other sections here. Um, so together with Carl, who is a hunchback, the guy that assisted Frankenstein from avoiding the gallows by substituting a priest at the last possible second. Um, this hunchback Carl um, works with the two of them. They are um, uh, busy still with uh, Frankenstein's experiment, which is to create a new life. In this case, he has, wants to transplant um, Carl's brain into his new monster. And the monster, well, creature, it's not even really a monster. It is not a scarred up, cobbled together piece of junk that we've seen in previous movies. It's... Um, well, it's a guy you can see has a couple of scars from whatever they've done in terms of like putting his hands on and stuff like that. But he's otherwise normal looking. So Frankenstein's actually perfected his process. And Carl, well, he's a hunchback. He has problems with one of his hands and one of his legs. And so he's all happy to get his brain transplanted into this thing because he figures he's going to get a new body out of it that's, you know, perfect working condition. And he particularly is interested in doing this because Margaret, you remember the uh, daughter of the hypochondriac woman, comes to work in the charity hospital and he meets her and, you know, really wants to impress her, but figures he can't being a crippled guy like he is. So the transplant does succeed, but then um, Cleve gets all excited and starts telling Carl about, okay, this is going to be wonderful. You are going to be looked at and essentially probed and picked at for the next rest of your life <laughs> because we have actually done it this time around. And uh, so Carl kind of freaks out. Uh, he gets, he's been, uh, it's made clear that his condition is kind of fragile, which you would expect after getting your brain transplanted. Um, so Frankenstein and Cleve have him, you know, tied down essentially in restraints to make sure that he doesn't go running off and screwing up his head. But in fact, he then freaks out because he's like, God, I don't want to be, you know, the number one subject of all these medical people poking at me for the rest of my life. Um, so he gets Margaret to let him go and he goes back to Frankenstein's uh, laboratory where Frankenstein has been keeping his old body and he throws his old body into the incinerator. Unfortunately, while he is there, he's attacked by um, the janitor, or um, I'm not sure if it's janitor or somebody who ran the property, but um, he's attacked by him because the, the janitor guy thinks that uh, Carl is some kind of burglar or thief. And when he's attacked, well, um, he, uh, he's able to um, 
strangle the janitor person, but unfortunately, in the process, he's gotten himself beaten up, kind of. So Frankenstein and, Car and Cleve discover the guy is missing. They start going looking for him, and the next morning, um, M Carl has made his way to Margaret's aunt's stable. Okay, so he's out in the barn. And uh, she goes to fetch uh, uh, Car um, uh, uh, Cleve, However, by this time, uh, when they get back, Carl has left. And that night, Carl, um, now suffering from brain damage or something like that, uh, ambushes and strangles a local girl. And the night after that, he rushes into a uh, evening reception where Frankenstein is present, and he's redeveloped his deformities. He still, you know, has problems again. Uh, he begs Frankenstein for help, help using Frankenstein's real name, and then he collapses on the floor and he dies. Well, Frankenstein disregards Cleve's uh, warnings. Cleve says, we, we better leave the country right now before they come get you. And uh, Frankenstein says, no. And he appears before the medical council where he denies being Frankenstein. But the set counselors at that point are totally unsatisfied. They think he probably is Frankenstein. So they go out and have his grave exhumed. And what should they find there? The priest that he had gotten killed and left behind. So at the same time, the uh, people in the hospital have sort of gotten word that this guy is Frankenstein, and they attack him and leave him for dead. But Cleve rec uh, rescues him, rushes him to the laboratory, where he takes out Frankenstein's brain. Um, the authorities show up at that point. He shows the body to them, dead, and he says, you know, there's nothing I could do. And they leave saying, okay, well, we're going to have to, you know, bury him in unconsecrated ground. <laughs> Um, but once he is alone again, Cleve says, okay, well, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do this, but I'm going to try to reattach his body. And that's where we got our ending plot twist. Because he puts Frankenstein's brain into a new body that he had laying around, I guess, which just happens to look almost exactly like Frankenstein himself looked. Um... So, sometime later in London, and that's where this picture comes from, Frankenstein is now going as Dr. Frank, and he is welcoming new patients into his um, business. So, scene. Um, as I said, very different for a Frankenstein movie. Most of the time, it is just sitting there rehashing stuff. Um, they say, okay, that worked well. People got scared by that. They like that. Let's rehash it. Nah, this was its own story. Um, Got to give him a lot of credit for that. It's own story. It did, however, have cringe moments, a number of them that I always like to get out of the way. Now, if I don't cause my green screen to knock over behind me, I'll be all set. It's a lot closer than you think. Okay, um, the um, cringe moments. The substitution of, the, of uh, the, the priest for Frankenstein. Big cringe moment because it is a retcon. Now, remember I talked about Crisis on Infinite Earths and how it screwed up DC Comics to this fracking day. The term retcon actually originates with what happened after Crisis on Infinite Earths because DC kept retconning and retconning and retconning. They retcon to this very day. What that stands for is retroactive continuity. And again, it was first really applied to DC Comics, but it became quickly popular in describing other media because it means you are adding things not seen in the original work or you're just plain modifying the original work after the fact so that your current film or TV show or your comic, your novel can make sense. What a retcon actually is, is lazy writing. And yes, I'm calling out all of you DC hacks. You are all lazy writers, and you have been since 1985 at least. There should be no good reason to retroactive continuity anything. Uh, we do see this. You see this early on in like movie serials where they will not show you everything that happened at the last one so they could have a cliffhanger. But mostly, if you see it today, it is just lazy writing. So if we look here, right at the beginning, we can see if we look at our opening card, there's two cards that they give us with some uh, text attached to set the scene. The first card says, In the year 1860, Baron Frankenstein was condemned to death for the brutal murders committed by the monster he created. And no, he wasn't. 
<laughs> he was condemned to death because he, uh, for the murder of his housekeeper slash mistress. Nobody knew anything about the monster. In fact, it was a story point that a priest came at the beginning of the novel, beginning of the movie to talk to him, and he tries to convince the whole entire mo- rest of the movie is him trying to convince the priest that this is real, and the priest doesn't believe him. And his buddy from that one, Paul, said it was all just the ravings of a madman. So nobody knew. You know, um, yeah, so yeah, it was just silly. I, like I say, they, they sort of said, eh, let's retro, retcon that into something we can use as a stepping off point. Then our second card says the entire, the whole continent breathed a sigh of relief when the guillotine was called upon to end his life of infamy. No, no, they didn't. He was condemned again for the murder of his ha- uh, housewife slash uh, mistress. Uh, nobody knew about the monster. Nobody even thought he had a life of infamy other than killing that person. It was probably some level of news because he was a baron. He was a member of the aristocracy. Um, but other than that, he just killed this person as far as anybody knew. Now, of course, in real life, um, a, the monster killed her. But nobody knew about the monster. <laughs> So here we are again with uh, having us a retcon. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. More retconning. Carl the Hunchback comes out of absolutely nowhere. Um, As with many retcons, we have a character introduced in this film who was not in the last one but should have been present. And that's Carl. And they put him in because he is a lot like the Igor concept from the Universal movies. You know, hunchback, problems, walking, kind of gribble. They're counting on the audience, really, to know, be more familiar with those Universal films than they were the previous one, uh, Curse of Frankenstein, maybe just forget some of it. That's all of this retconning. It is being closer to what was in the uh, Universal films and sort of counting on the audience saying, oh, okay, that's what happened and kind of forgetting about the previous movie. Um, Because it's all stuff that wasn't there, (laughs) that's retconned, that puts in everything here. It's just, it's all really, um, well, I'll talk about it when I get to the writer, because there's an interesting story about that. Larry Larry says, Hunchback Assistant, check, right. Yeah, exactly. Just trying to make it look more like the movies from uh, Universal for purposes of getting a plot going. Other cringe moments. They killed a priest. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, to begin with, wouldn't somebody notice? You know, if you had a, a priest in, in some small village somewhere that disappeared, wouldn't you notice? Um, otherwise, too, killing a priest was kind of beyond the pale. Um, you know, historically, it's usually only been done by high royalty kings and queens and princes and stuff like that. Um, could a baron do it? Well, maybe. But even the 20th century mafia tended to balk at killing priests. Uh, I'm sure this was largely, you know, in addition to getting them out of a, you know, the hole they dug themselves in uh, where they couldn't do anything with it. In addition to doing that in a sort of believable fashion, because a priest would be along with him to the gallows. Um, but it was also for dramatic effect. It was telling the audience, just look how terrible Frankenstein is. He had a priest killed to save himself. Um, but again, where does this come from? Who wants to support this thing, right? He killed somebody, as far as anybody knows. Why would anybody support him not getting the guillotine? (laughs) And why would they conspire to kill a priest? I mean, okay, you could say they're getting paid a bunch of cash. Still, you know, I mean, he's a a murderer. Even if you got a ton of cash, I mean, I guess... It's just the sort of deal where I looked at it and went, he killed a priest? Holy crap, you know. <laughs> Supernatural Technicolor. Yes, that's one of the great things about all of these Hammer films is we see these characters in color for the first time. So, And yes, you can see on the thing here, it uh, bills it as uh, being in Technicolor, which was a big deal back then. Very bright colors. Not as bright this time around as the previous film, but that's kind of a story I'm going to get into. Great moments on this one. Okay, Frankenstein actually perfected his process. Wow, that's kind of cool. Not showing up in other movies. In other movies, something is fracked up. But he has perfected the process here. And really, the only reason that Carl ran into any trouble was because he left Frankenstein's care too early. If he'd laid laid there, you know, and not moved around very much, he probably would have been fine. 
Um, he certainly wouldn't have gotten into a fight and had some kind of brain damage that caused everything else. Uh, so the fact that, and of course we see the ending, um, he's totally perfected the process. You know, this is one of those deals where I think, again, by the next movie, they decided they'd written themselves into a corner, which is why Evil of Frankenstein sucks so bad as it does, one of the many reasons. Um, they wrote themselves into what they thought was a corner on this one and really retconned their way out of it with Evil of Frankenstein. But the ending... Now, ordinarily, Frankenstein in popular culture has meant the monster. Um, technically, that's not accurate. The Frankenstein is the people, is Frankenstein, uh, Baron Frankenstein, or his descendants, or something like that. And the monster is always just Frankenstein's monster. But here in this case, the only time I'm aware of in a Frankenstein movie, Frankenstein becomes the creature at the end. So I kind of like that, you know, the notion that he has perfected this process and is now taking advantage of it for himself. Uh, technically, you could conceivably live forever um, simply by transplanting your brain from body to body to body as it gets older. So, Yep, Larry Larry says, Can't, well, couldn't wait to heal and then ran away. If he hadn't, like we see in the end, I think he would have been fine. He would have been perfectly fine. Now, all of this... All of this, the, all of these movies, these first two movies, is completely retconned out of existence by the next film, The Evil of Frankenstein. Both of them totally retconned out of existence in favor of a backstory that was much more similar to the universal backstory of the, of the uh, thing. Lazy writing. Um, I will never review <laughs> The Evil of Frankenstein except under a couple of circumstances. One is if you pay me, if you get on my Patreon and give me a lot of money, or conceivably if you send it to me, because I will review anything that gets sent to me. So, otherwise, I'm not going to review Evil of Frankenstein next year, unless I'm desperate or something for material, because it's a really terrible movie. I watched the first 20 minutes of it, and everything about it is awful. The makeup is awful. The retconning out of existence, these last two films, because I think they decided they you know, put them into a corner. Just bad. Everything about it is bad. It's, it's a low-budget film like these two were, but they didn't do a very good job with their budget on Evil of Frankenstein. Larry, Larry says, brain doesn't age. Well, I, I mean, I assume it would in real life. But, you know, all of this stuff, you know, you're talking about transplanting a, a brain in the 1800s. Nobody was going to do that, you know. Uh, I think some Russian may have tried a head transplant recently. And... And that's got to be a boatload easier than the brain, and it's still got to be incredibly difficult. I haven't followed that, uh, that um, story, but I think that's what happened. But uh, I think in this universe, we could say the brain doesn't age. It was just moved from person to person over a long period of time. But as I say, next film, Evil of Frankenstein, just wiped the slate completely and retconned both of these movies out of existence. So the writer on this is the same guy who wrote uh, The Curse of Frankenstein, Jimmy Sangster. Going over his IMDb again, because it's always useful to do that. Uh, face tra transplants haven't worked. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole problem. I mean, there's two things. One is getting the nerves to work right. I mean, you're attaching somebody's like head to another spinal cord. Yikes. You know, I can't imagine. Uh, that's got to be horrifically difficult. Um, but then you got rejection. You know, just outright rejection. You can't put these things together without running into rejection problems. Then they tend to give you lots of drugs to reduce the rejection, but then it'll also reduce your immune system so you can get sick from anything. Um, you just can't do it. Certainly not with the technology that we have right now. You just can't do it. So... But Jimmy Sangster, the writer here and was writer on the last one, uh, his IMDb is 1956 to 2000 with 74 writing credits, generally film until about 1972 when he mostly turned to TV. But he wrote quite a lot of Hammer's horror films. Um, <laughs> now, as I always say, if you want to impress me, then what you have to do is not win an Academy Award or an Emmy. They both suck. In the science fiction field, if you want to impress me, you win a Hugo. And he did. Sangster won a Hugo in 1959 for Dracula, also a Hammer film. And I will be reviewing that later this month. This whole month is going to be nothing 
but horror and or well like next week when I'm next weekend when I'm not going to be here and I'll be doing something more interesting or at least different from what I usually do with the show but the rest of the movie is going to Bristol Month is going to be horror or something like it and so I'm going to review Dracula in about three weeks I think uh, Larry Larry says facial skin transplant have worked really fine yeah I, I mean you can do it a limited way you can't do it in a limited way it's just when you get into certain things it can rejection just becomes a huge issue that we have not yet gotten around um, probably will at some point or um, we're gonna have artificial skin that works just as well that is certainly another possibility we just get artificial stuff uh, that's also things they're working on so Anyway, he won the Hugo in 1959. He also won an Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films Award, a Lifetime Career Award in 1977. Interesting things about this. Um, Sangster has said on the record that J James Carreras, who was one of the producers on this, took a poster design and went to Hollywood where he pre-sold this film to Columbia. Now, the reason the last one, one of the reasons the last one had done so well was because it had been released by Warner Brothers. Hammer was based in Britain, in, in London, but they went and they got Warner Brothers to release, which meant that they got a much, much wider audience, both in the United States and elsewhere, than they would have had otherwise. Um, so they did the same thing here. They said, that worked, let's go over and see if we can sell it. They didn't have a script. They, they didn't have a movie. They just had a poster. So James Carreras went over there and pre-sold the thing to uh, Columbia with just a poster. So when he got back, he said, okay, Sangster, you got to write the script. And Sangster said, I, I killed Baron Frankenstein. In the first film, I killed him at the end. And Sangster stated, well, you got six weeks to write the next one, buddy. And then we start shooting. You'll think of something. Hence, all of the retconning we got. Sangster is an otherwise pretty good uh, writer. Um, he's done some stuff. And, and this isn't bad, considering where it goes. It's not bad at all. Um, but the fact that he only six weeks to figure out how we're going to get Frankenstein off of the guillotine, and that's why we got the retconning that we did. Lazy writing? Yes. Um, but by the same token, we can kind of forgive it because Sangster was operating under no budget and very little time, six weeks to come up with a uh, shooting script. So <laughs> that's pretty unheard of, that is, uh, six weeks for a shooting script. Uh, a little bit of, I'm going to talk about his writing here. Um, he did a lot of retconning, kind of because he had to to get Frankenstein out of the mess. But by the same token, he's taken this story and gone in a completely different direction than any other Frankenstein movie of which I'm aware. Uh, even the young Frankenstein, which is, you know, a comedy that I'll probably get to at some point. Um, even that, you know, was using essentially parts of the mythos. Um, this one goes a step further. It's a logical step. It says, okay, well, he worked on these creatures previously and that didn't work out. Now he's got somebody who actually is good. Uh, he has perfected the process. He can, he can transplant brains around. So, good place to go with the story. Um, the twist at the end I did not see coming. As I said, I haven't watched these films. So I didn't see that. Um, I like when that happens. It makes me enjoy the movie more. It is not retreading everything that happened in the previous film or retreading stuff that has happened in other films. It is going off in its own separate, unique direction, which is why... Mary Shelley is not credited here, and ordinarily she is. Um, regardless of what the story has, she'll be credited because of Frankenstein. No, no credit for her here. Uh, Larry Larry says, no time for a script for a film that will last forever. Yeah, that's the thing, too. It's a popular Hammer movie, and it's going to be around, like you say, kind of forever. It's not Plan 9 from Outer Space. And the script is pretty good. I mean, considering that he has working under a time crunch, and the only thing he can think of to get Frankenstein out of the guillotine where he was being led away to in the last film, and logically so, um, was a bit of retconning. So, you know, he did do that. But again, because of the fact that it's going off in its own direction, you know, that makes it stand out from all of the other Frankenstein sequels. They really do retread stuff. And so for him to have come out with something that is relatively original, you know, you're saying, okay, take these characters and, and move them down the line. Well, it's, it's like watching a Marvel movie. It's like watching the Marvel stuff. You know, 
back in 2008, Iron Man had a suit, you know, clearly that was practically bolted onto him. Now, 10 years later, he's got uh, nanotech. It, it moves along a progression that is logical throughout those films. So this is a logical progression. It is not retreading the old stuff. So yay. Uh, Larry Levy says, the extra body around that happens to look like Frankenstein is a bit of a stretch. Yes, I agree. I agree. It's there so that you can have the twist ending. Um, but you're right. Having it look exactly like Frankenstein. I mean, I think I know what they were going for here. They were saying to themselves, we've got to leave ourselves open for another movie. And we want to use um, the same actors. <laughs> So if he's going to die, we have to bring him back in such a way that he's, um, you know, it's reversible in somehow. So him looking like himself, yeah, uh, a bit much, a bit much. Uh, it's one of the other cringe moments. It's like, where did that come from? I mean, we don't even see the second body throughout the entire film. We have no idea it's there. And it just pops up at the end so that we can have our little twist ending. But you're right, Larry, Larry. Uh, extra body around that happens to look like Frankenstein is a stretch. Um, generally speaking, though, I, I'm impressed by the fact that unlike most Frankenstein movies, it is not retreading the same stuff over and over. And I like that about it. Um, Stankster uh, also does have, as I mentioned last week, a six degrees of Star Trek that a lot of these people don't have because they're working over in Britain as opposed to the United States. But he did do an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man that was produced by Harv Bennett. And Bennett later went on to uh, produce Star Trek's Two Through Five. Uh, a couple of other people on this, James, uh, Huford James, um, he is credited with additional dialogue. He has only two credits to his name, this and apparently an episode of London Playhouse, not a clue. No awards, no way to judge his writing because I don't know where he came from. I don't know what he did here. Additional dialogue, I don't know what it means, so... Uh, Larry Larry says, Star Wars new movie series could have used an extra body of Peter Cushing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Cushing, unfortunately, is the uh, CGI face, which somehow, despite the army of people that worked on it, it just is kind of lifeless. You know, it's, it looks like him, but it's still kind of lifeless. Just makes you say, hey. Did they have to use that character again? Could they have not? I mean, could you, you could have used Vader, you know. Uh, they had to reshoot those and stuck Vader in at the last minute. So We also have George Baxt, who is uh, uncredited with additional dialogue on this. Um, he does have an IMDb that goes somewhere. 1954 to 1982 with 23 writer credits, almost exclusively television. He did do 10 episodes of a TV series, The Sword of Freedom, uh, from 1957 to 58, and probably worked on this one right after that. He also wrote three novels in 1967, and he was a Hugo nominee for Night of the Eagle in 1963. Again, no way to judge any of these two guys' writing. I don't know what they did. Additional dialogue can mean all kinds of things. I don't know what they did here that got them in the film, so I can't judge either of what they did. Um, he does, however, uh, Mr. Baxt does have a six degrees of Star Trek because he wrote an episode of The Defenders, which was a 1960s TV series in the United States that had William Shatner playing a, a district attorney, Earl Rhodes. Uh, so he probably put some words into William Shatner's mouth. Now, the characters. There are a lot more characters in this film than there were. I think the film is still a relatively low budget. I could not find pictures, picture, I mean, uh, figures for how low the budget was. I think it was still low, but it was bigger than the last one. We had a lot more sets. We had a lot more people that they were paying for, both regulars and I mean, both uh, characters with lines and just extras. Um, so I think it did have a larger budget. Um, so I'm going to stick to just the uh, main characters. There are some ancillary ones that come and go that I'll probably talk about from time to time. But I'm just going to stick with the main characters because otherwise you just get off a huge long tangent. This is probably, oddly enough, going to be one of my shorter reviews because I didn't do 45 minutes on setting uh, the uh, uh, context for it. So here we are at 8.49 and I'm starting on the characters, which is pretty good for my time. Uh, going to come closer to the two hours. In fact, if that happens, if I happen to get some of my viewers in here who want to talk about uh, some other weird stuff going on in science fiction, I have some science fiction news that probably people would be interested in, or at least hearing me talk about it, maybe. 
So coming back in this film from the list, as with the last one, we have Peter Cushing playing Victor Frankenstein, going through his IMDb as it did last week. It goes from 1939 to 1986 with 131 acting credits, almost exclusively film. And of course, as Larry Larry mentions, science fiction fans recently will remember him as Grand Moff Tarkin in Star Wars and the lifeless CGI, lifeless behind the eyes face in uh, Rogue One. Um, I always want to point out, and, I, and it was true for Sangster, the writer as well, when you get into this many credits, he had 131 over about a uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, about a 30 or 40, almost 50 year period. When you have this many credits, um, if you're doing more than one movie a year, hell, if you're doing one movie a year, if that's all you do, you are a fracking success in the acting world. Most actors never act. Um, they go on auditions. They do plays and things like that that don't pay a whole hell of a lot. They get their money from waiting tables. There are thousands of actors out there whose names you will never know unless they happen to sign the check that you're paying for at the, at the restaurant. So when you see somebody who's doing more than one movie a year, as he did, you're talking about somebody who is among an elite group of actors who's actually working. I like to call them workers. They were working, 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 and he is certainly one of those guys. Larry Larry says they sold the movie only on a poster and then they had to go write it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they took the guy took the poster over, sold it to Columbia, probably told him he had a movie and he didn't. He sold it, sold it to Columbia and then he came back and said, uh, Sangster, you got to write this movie in six weeks. Go. <laughs> um, it's one of those things that always reminds me, you know, it's, it's a level of chutzpah that you, you sometimes see, you know, like Microsoft, right? They sold Microsoft DOS, MS-DOS, the first operating system Microsoft created, to IBM without having it. They sold it to them for an enormous amount of money and actually licensed it to them, and they didn't have it. They just barreled on through as if it was something that was real, that wasn't vaporware at the time, and uh, sold it and then had to go and find somebody who had an operating system and bought it off of them. Um, it's like I say, it's a, a level of chutzpah that you sometimes see. Um, I'm never quite sure. I mean, I guess in the long term, you have to say it was good. It was a good idea because it all worked out. You know, they were able to make a movie that is still popular today. So, hey, uh, if, if they'd sold it and it turned out to be crap, that might have been another thing. But it's a pretty decent movie with uh, retcons and, you know, stretching of logic a little bit aside. So it's a decent enough movie. Now, uh, Peter Cushing won awards. He won the BAFTA in 1956 for Best Actor. He won the Fantasporo Best Actor in 1984. In 1976, he won the Catalonian International Film Festival Award for Best Actor and also won it in 1983, also for Best Actor. In terms of his performance, uh, Peter Cushing always gives a great performance. He, he always comes off as a very classically trained British actor who can pretty much do anything and make it work. Um, there's probably, and I didn't notice it per se, but there's probably a fair amount of stupid dialogue in this movie. I always figure a really good actor is one who can take stupid dialogue and still make it work somehow. You know, Patrick Stewart, Sir Patrick in the second season of Star Trek, not good episodes, had a lot of crappy dialogue, and he still could make it work. And Peter Cushing is certainly like that, and he brings a lot of stature and what we would call gravitas to the role, um, such that when he's on the screen, pretty much he's stealing the show. You want to watch him. Um, he's one of those guys that I suspect in real life has a fair amount of charisma. I mean, you can see it on the screen. Um, I always like to say it's like I, I saw Hulk Hogan in, in, in person uh, in Omaha one time after having seen him on TV for a long time. And Hogan is on TV clearly a very uh, charismatic guy. You see him in person and you want to look at him. I don't know what it is. It's a personal magnetism that I certainly don't have. I don't think you can learn it. If I could, I'd probably be still acting. I think it's just something you're born with. And I think Peter Cushing is the same way. Obviously classically trained, but still somebody you want to watch. And that's why pretty much whenever he's on the screen, he largely steals the show. Um, in terms of his general characterization, it's it's fine here. He's good. He does you know, takes the material, makes it his own, and uh, does a great way through. So, no problems with his performance. Uh, not Academy Award winning or uh, Hugo Award winning, 
but uh, still a good performance, and he does good with the material he's got. Now, our non-love interest here, uh, our young lady, is uh, 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 Margaret, and she's played by Eunice Gason. Her IMDb ran up to 1972, where she had 53 acting credits, so also a worker, with multiple TV series, which means there was only a one credit in um, IMDb, but that could translate out into goodness knows how many episodes. Um, she never had any regulars on these TV series. She did multiple TV series, never had any regulars, but she did do multiple shows where she came back as different characters or came back as the same character more than once. She did largely British productions or sh uh, films being shot in Br Great Britain and today is often known as the very first Bond girl. Um, she played Sylvia Trench in Dr. No, the first Bond movie in 1962. Uh, first one starring Sean Connery. Very first Bond girl and then later played the same role in Russia with, from Russia with Love, another bond, bond film uh, several years later. There we go. says, I think Cushing did a good Sherlock Holmes film. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, he's great for Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he's great anywhere you put him. But Sherlock Holmes, you know, traditionally he's a character who's, you know, so much smarter than everybody else. Um, that, in it, again, it takes somebody like uh, Peter Cushing who's got this general level of charisma. And you want to look at this guy, and yet he's so much more intelligent. So like you say, um, he did do some good Sherlock Holmes films. I totally agree, having seen those. Um, in terms of uh, her performance here, uh, it's fine. Um, she does fine with the material she's given. You know, she's really kind of... Um, she's there to get the plot moving. You know, she's there to get Carl more motivated. Um, but really, she doesn't have much of a character otherwise. She's this person who is there to get the plot moving. Um, so in that respect, she does fine. She, she's with the material she's given. She does fine. Um, just not much of a character there is all. Just has to go from one thing to another to get the plot moving. Then, as Dr. Hans Cleave, uh, Frankenstein's partner in crime, we have Matthew, Francis Matthews, rather, who played that role. He, uh, his IMDb is 1951 to 2012, with another guy who was a worker, 106 acting credits, largely television, though he did numerous TV series with numerous regulars. So again, this is one where we may show up as a single credit in IMDb, but that translates out into 15, 20 episodes. Who knows? If the show was long-lived enough, could be... Well, like if it's Bonanza, 420 episodes. That only shows up in IMDb as a single credit. He did largely, uh, Matthews largely did British productions. And he did Dracula, Prince of Darkness, which was the second Hammer film. They made Dracula, what is called, by the way, Horror of Dracula in today's... Um, uh, it was in the American market. They called it Horror of Dracula, to not mistake it with all of those you know, ones, that, uh, especially the original one. Uh, so, but he did, he play. he was in Dracula, Prince of Darkness, which was the second one in that series. Hammer did new, multiple Dracula films, and Dracula, Pen Prince of Darkness was the second one he did. Um, he has won an award in 2002. He won the BAFTA TV Situation Comedy Award for Gimme, 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 which I have no idea what it is. <laughs> um, in terms of his performance, I think he did fine. Um... Not the main character. That's largely Frankenstein. And he does do some things that are there primarily to move the plot along. Um, but, again, uh, fine with the material he's given. Um, I can't see, you know, thinking about it, that there were a ton of stupid lines or anything like that that he had to deliver. Um, but he made what amounted to what looked kind of like uh, a leading man, although the, the role isn't really that. Um, the fact that uh, he did you know, uh, blackmail uh, Frankenstein and then becomes basically his cohort, cohort in crime. Um, good performance all the way around. Uh, can't, uh, can't really fault him anywhere. Um, just not a hell of a lot there. You know, he's there partly to move the thing along and also partly for exposition. 
you need somebody like that. It's the same reason the doctor and doctor who always has companions because you need somebody for the doctor to be able to describe what's going on so the audience knows what's going on. And that's some of what we see here too. This character is there partly because it has to be Frankenstein telling him what's about to happen so the audience knows what's about to happen. But he does a good job with it. I have no problem with his performance either. And again, like some people in this, he has a six degrees of Star Trek, and it's actually five specific degrees. He was the voice of Captain Scarlet in Captain Scarlet and the Mysterions, which was a Jerry and Sylvia Anderson super marionation show. Uh, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson did a lot of stuff with puppets uh, in the 19, late 1950s and in the 19, all the way through the 1970s. So. But they couldn't just call it puppets. They had to come up with their own name. So they called it Super Marionation. And uh, so he was the voice of Captain Scarlet in what was basically a puppet show. Now, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson then produced Space 1999 in the middle of the 1970s. And the second season of Space 1999 was line produced by Fred Freiberger. And Fred Freiberger had line produced the third season of Star Trek. And he's something of uh, infamous in fandom because of that. People tend to think the third season of Star Trek is the worst. I agree. It had more duds than it did good ones. The uh, hit-miss ratio on Star Trek in the first two years is pretty good. It's pretty good. Not every episode is great, but the ones that are made tend to be very memorable. Uh, third season, not so much. You get stuff like Spock's Brain and The Children Shall Lead, watering down the scripts like what was intended for the Enterprise incident. Um, you know, a lot of stuff like that just kind of sucked. Um, so Freiberger did uh, do the second season of Space 1989, which people tend to think sucks more than the first one, although from my perspective, it's about 50-50 because the first one tends to be kind of dumb in places. Um, I don't think he did any hurt, harm really doing it. And of course, another uh, degree of Star Trek we can talk about here is Martin Landau played Commander Koenig on Space 1999, and Landau was at one time considered for Spock in the original series. Kind of tenuous on that one in terms of... This. They're all pretty tenuous on that one, so... Uh, playing the creature and uh, uh, Carl after his brain is been, has been translated, transplanted is Michael Gwynn. His IMDb, 1952 to 1976, 93 actor credits. Again, a worker. And uh, he did multiple TV series with multiple recurring characters. So again, it's 100... And, I mean, it's 93 acting credits, but then, you know, he might have 10 episodes behind it, so... Uh, he did not win any awards. In terms of his performance here, I actually like it a lot. He's performing as someone who has had his brain transplanted and is pretty happy with the results. Um, you know, he, he's got a couple of scars, but it's not horrifying, and he's happy with the results. And then, of course, things happen to him, and it gets worse and worse. And by the end, he's playing a decent enough, you know, psychotic monster guy. But I did like his performance in the beginning um, because they transplanted his brain and he's looking at himself in the mirror and he's like, I can move my arm, I can move my leg, this is wonderful, you know, maybe I'll get the girl. Uh, and then it all goes to hell for him. But I think he did a good performance there. I, I liked his performance quite a lot. Kind of like I liked young Victor last, uh, last week. It's, it's a good performance all the way around, so I like him. Uh, Larry Larry says he's an episode of Faulty Towers. Uh, that's where this came from. <laughs> I could not find a more contemporary picture of him, so I took the one from Faulty Towers. That is the uh, episode he was in, yes. So, yep. Now, the uh, pre-op, um, Carl, is played by Oscar Kwitek. He also has a pretty long IMDb, 1946 to 1993, with 101 acting credits, largely TV, with multiple series and multiple recurring characters. So, again, a worker. Why, you know, can't fault him at all. Uh, no awards. In terms of his performance, um, it's fine. We don't really see him a ton. And when we are, he is Frankenstein's uh, lackey. You know, he's the Igor that they put in. No problem with his performance. I think he does fine. You know, he comes off as a guy. You know, it's a bit of a twist, you know, because most of the time Frankenstein is piecing this together out of parts. And the last brain he got in the last film got damaged. 
Um, so to see a guy who is actually saying, no, 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 I want my brain taken out of this body, um, was kind of nice. And I think he did a good performance there as a result. Um, other things in terms of the performance here, uh, I mean, the, the production itself. Um, the film, it was shot at Bray Studios in Great Britain, and production commenced, this is kind of interesting, on January 6, 1958, three days after Hammer had wrapped filming Dracula, which, again, I'm going to review later this month. Um, that movie, by the way, Dracula, also stars Peter Cushing in it and was also directed by Terrence Fisher, who is the director of this and uh, the previous and many other Hammer films. In terms of the direction, again, it was by uh, Terrence Fisher, who had done the last one. His IMDb, again, runs 1936 to 1991 with 64 director credits, 18 editor credits. So he was pretty much working as well. And he did a lot of horror, particularly for Hammer. He was nominated for a Hugo in 1959 for Dracula. Did not win. Uh, in terms of his direction, um, I found the previous one a lot more creative. Here they were working with a smaller budget, but it was clearly larger than the, the first movie. Um, the first movie, I was impressed by this in the cinematography because I thought it made an extraordinarily good use of the budget. Um, here, in general, the cinematography is a little less creative. Um, maybe it's just because they had more budget and had to spend it on the extras and the sets, which they did a lot of. Or maybe it's just because he just walked off six days previously off of another movie. <laughs> I, I don't know how you have a whole hell of a lot of time to uh, sit down and work out storyboards and all that. May have been he and the cinematographer were doing things a lot more off the cuff because they both just come off of another movie. So It is interesting enough that, you know, because of the nature of the film, and the fact that it does survive well. Um, interesting in as much as I'd, I'd be curious to what Fisher thought about this film in the context of his larger career. You know, I mean, it was something like, yeah, God, you know, I wish we'd had more time to do stuff with that. Uh, or would he be satisfied? I don't know. My guess is that they probably didn't have a lot of time to sit down and think this stuff out. So a lot of the photography and the direction seems a little generic. Um, you know, it's not like if you watch the beginning of, uh, uh, well, this film. If you watch the beginning and the main thing that I remember being a little creative was when they were going to put Frankenstein into the guillotine and they pan up to the guillotine and then you see it fall. I thought that was decent enough. And he did also do a really interesting shot, a dolly shot at the beginning of uh, their Dracula. Excuse me, I'm going to have to cough again. He did do a neat dolly shot at the beginning of their uh, Dracula. I started watching that, and uh, it's a neat dolly shot. It goes through the credits and then turns around and does some cool stuff. Not a lot of that here. Uh, so that's what I think of the direction. It's okay. It's okay. You know, you can't... Uh, again, uh, I think their biggest consideration here was probably time. You know, write the script in six weeks, finish Dracula, and come over here six frackin' days later, you know. Uh, directors usually need some time <laughs> to prep, to look at the script, to get a storyboard, etc. And I don't think they had a lot of that time this time around. Cinematography, again, is by uh, Jack Asher, whose IMDb was 1935 to 1965. Over a 30 year period with 40, uh, 43 cinematographer credits and 11 camera and electrical department credits, which usually means that you're actually the cameraman. You're sitting there in the seat holding, you know, running the camera. He did exclusively film with a lot of Hammer horror films and won BAFTA nomination for The Scarlet Blade in 1964. Again, a guy who was pretty much working, still doing more than one uh, movie a year. As you can see from this one, he did Dracula and then Frankenstein, um, The uh, Revenge of Frankenstein, back to frack and back. Um, the cinematography itself. Um, again, not as creative, I don't think, as the first one. They probably were doing this some by the seat of their pants. You know, maybe getting storyboards ready for today's shooting, you know, the night before. I don't know for sure. I, you know, have to talk to him or read something about this that I didn't have access to or didn't want to spend an entire week doing. Um, but it's not as creative this time around. It's the camera tends to sit still a lot more. 
Um, they had more sets and more people, so there's a lot more wide shots. You know, in the previous film, they were limited by the sets and the number of characters they had, so they did a lot of close-ups and things like that. Not so much here. It's maybe a little bit more generic because of it. It's one of those deals where sometimes with just the right amount of, adverse, of adversity, art does thrive. Here, I think they had the adversity but couldn't get too artistic because they were just running along as fast as they could. Uh, so again, cinematography is fine. You know, at the very bare minimum, what you must have with a cinematographer is you must know what you're supposed to look at and be able to see what you're supposed to see. And that certainly happened all the way through. And there was a fair, I mean, when it got into things like, you know, dark areas of a building um, and in particular, the uh, hospital um, really, really liked the hospital. Not so much for cinematography, more for production design. And I'll talk about that next. <laughs> Production design was by Bernard Robinson, who has an IMDb that went 1940 to 1969 with 42 production department, production designer credits, rather, and another 36 art director credits. So, so that means he was working. He did almost exclusively horror and quite a lot of Hammer films. In terms of the production design, as I say, I really like the hospital. It gives you a good feeling between that and the makeup and the costumes and some of the characters who are in there. You know, the guy who mentions he almost never bathes in a hospital. And I'm sure that was intentional to show the viewer, hey, these guys, you know, it was pretty bad back then. And it was. You know, they did surgery without any conception of sterilization. You know, people would get infections, and doctors just said, well, it happens sometimes. You know, they didn't have any notion that if they, you know, um, disinfected everything, wore gloves and stuff like that, you know, that were, uh, they didn't even have them. So it was a very different world, you know, in terms of doing surgery and certainly in those, you know, hospitals, just people sitting around half the time waiting to die. Um, so I liked very much that cinematography and, and, and also I mean, the production design because it looked like if you've ever seen old drawings, because you can't, you know, the photography didn't exist at the time. If you look at old drawings, it looks a lot like a real hospital, just people laying around with bad things happening to them in a place that's not even remotely sterile. And, you know, your doctor's walking from having done surgery on somebody with a communicable disease, and then he comes straight over to you. You know, if you really want fun, look at what they were doing on sailing vessels of the time, warships. Oh, my God. You know, guys would be losing arms and legs right and left, and all that meant was they stick them on a, uh, you know, a table, saw their leg off while they're conscious because there's no way to do anything else, and to throw a lot of sand on the ground, on, on the deck, so that they didn't slip on all the blood. You know, so that's the sort of tech we're talking about here. And I thought that it really came, you know, it, it, it rang true for me. I, I liked very much what they did there, the production designer did with that set, and how it was shot to some extent. So I uh, liked it a lot. Um, other things the production designer did that I thought were good. Um, Sets in general, you know, I mean, the, the Frankenstein lab this time around looks a little bit on the generic side. Um, but again, I think to some extent, maybe they had a little bit more budget, but a lot less time. Uh, as I often say, the enemies of any theatrical endeavor are time, money, and a talent. They had plenty of talent on this, behind and in front of the screen. What they did not have was any time and very little money still. It was more money than the last one, but clearly not a really high budget film. Um, so I, the rest of the sets I think he did a, a great job with. Um, there were a couple that were kind of memorable. Um, the one that's the corridor outside Frankenstein's lab is pretty memorable to me. Um, as I see the hospital itself, um, everything else tended to be kind of, uh, you know, just necessary for the plot uh, and, and not necessarily those largest sets either. When you get out into like uh, the set where he's in the where the monster's in the barn, that's a pretty small set. <laughs> I can tell. You pull out very far from that, you're going to see that it's a set. Uh, when they did the interior uh, of uh, Margaret's aunt's house at the dinner party, again a fairly small set. Clearly not a huge budget, budget. But again, you know, production designer did good with what he had. And the hospital always impresses me because that's like real life at the time, which was pretty terrible. Visual effects. Um, there are none credited here. 
And I think that's probably because I don't think there were any visual effects. The last film we were credited for a matte painter, um, great guy who went on to do some brilliant work uh, and was very good at it. But here, I don't think we have any of those. Um, we don't have any on-set effects, that's for sure, and we don't have any visual effects, really. So, you know, nobody there. Uh, makeup is, again, gun done in this film, the same as it was by Philip Leakey. Um, they, uh, he has an IMDb, 1949 to 1975, with 58 makeup department credits, so over a 25-year period, roughly. Did more than, did roughly two and three movies a year, which is pretty good. He did a lot of film, exclusively film, and a lot of horror movies, particularly uh, ones for, that were for uh, Hammer. Here I have a picture uh, of him when he's doing the makeup for Frankenstein in the first film, Curse of Frankenstein. I uh, couldn't find anywhere they were doing him here, but that makeup is so generally iconic that that's why there are pictures of them floating around. This makeup was more just practical, and it was part of what contributed to the feeling that I had in the hospital that was just horrible. And the people working there were unsanitary and unkempt and sick themselves sometimes. And it was because the makeup tended to be very, very practical with that regard. Um, and he got it all. He got it all perfectly. You can screw that up. Um, in terms of makeup and costumes in theater, I have, I have at various times done my own makeup, done makeup for other people. I've done appliances once or twice. I know it's easy to frack that up, particularly where you don't have a whole hell of a lot of budget. And he's working with a lot of people that he has to make up, um, like the last film where it was basically the monster. So most of his practical makeup is very good. He doesn't screw it up at all. Um, and, of course, the monster... Monsters really only got a couple of scars, um, so you know, and any sort of degrades toward the end. But again, uh, generally practical, and when it's not, he does a good job. Um, so, you know, I'm a little surprised he didn't win awards. Uh, maybe you know something for the films he's doing here or a lifetime achievement, but no, nothing like that. So, costuming is was by Rosemary Burroughs, who had an IMDb from 1958 to 2005 with 91 production uh, costume and wardrobe department credits, particularly in British film, uh, which was they, she was when it talked about wardrobe that was almost usually synonymous with costume designer, which is what it was here. So again, 91 credits she was working, and she only she got five outright costume designer credits. Largely British films or films shot in Britain, and Revenge of Frankenstein was her third job. And she did a lot of other films for, for uh, Hammer. And like almost everybody else in this production, had just come off of doing Dracula six days before when they started. So, I would mention that she has done a ton of in-genre work, stuff that we would recognize but not necessarily understand that she's been behind in the costumes. So I can mention the movie Crow. Um, that was one she did. Also the movie Ishtar. <laughs> Not so much in genre, but I like to mention Ishtar because it is a dumping ground where I throw any movie that I say is just bad, stupid, doesn't make sense into. Ishtar was a film directed by um, Mike Nichols, who was a very accomplished and well thought of director when this film was made, and starred Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty, both of whom, I mean, Hoffman had already won um, Oscars. They were both very well regarded actors. And you'd think that this would be a recipe for a good film, but it was a recipe for awful, just awful, big budget, awful, and terrible. So the Ishtar is the beginning of what I like to call the Ishtar Cinematic Universe, or the ICU. And again, this is where I take any movie that's just too stupid um, to even think about being, you know, if it couldn't possibly happen in real life, then it must be part of the ICU. It's in the ICU, the Ishtar Cinematic Universe. So she was costumer on that. She was also on Willow, Strips, uh, Slipstream, which is an interesting movie. It's not a great movie by itself, but I like the fact Mark Hamill's in it. And he's a little bit older than when he did Luke. He's probably 15 or 20 years older. And in the episode, he's got a beard. And I can only think of him as looking like I would think of an older Luke Skywalker looking. Um, his beard is good there. Uh, in Last Jedi, you know, when he's a little younger and playing himself when he's younger, I kind of thought that beard was a little phony looking. But here, uh, in that film, Stripsley, it really worked. And I liked seeing him in that respect not so much the movie but 
Um, uh, uh, Rosemary Burroughs also did um, Lost in Space, the 1998 movie. Gladiator, again, not in genre, but certainly worth mentioning because of all the period costuming. She's done a ton of period costuming. Also, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Master and Commander, the uh, Journey to the Far, I mean, sorry, Master and Commander, Far Side of the World, which again, I, isn't in genre per se, but I mentioned it because of all the historic period costumes she's doing. She did a lot of that. She was also did uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the movie, and V for Vendetta. She was nominated for an Online Film and Television Association Award for her work in 101 Dalmatians. So, um, her costumes here I like very much. As I say, as somebody who, you know, I did a lot of makeup, but also what happened in Summerstock was you had so little time to do anything that, that the costumer, you know, for me, I generally got thrown to the costumer. They would say, go over there and sew exactly what she tells you to sew in the order you have to sew it. Because um, I, when I first started out, I knew nothing about costuming. I'm certainly no seamstress to this day. Um, mostly did what she said, but I got an appreciation for doing costumes because of that. It was appreciation for it. And how you can screw up period costumes and how much effort it can take to do them right. And here they were all done very, very right. There's still some hints of like 1950s fashion here-ish, but mostly what she's doing is very, very, very right, particularly with the minor characters. Um, you know, the one guy who says that he almost never bathes and runs around coughing all the time. It's, it's the makeup, it's the sets where he's at, it's the costume that all contributes to this. So she was doing good work with the costuming. She was taking the costuming and making it into something that made the characters, supported what the characters were. She got that. And that's one of the things I appreciate about costuming. Um, you know, it's like what I'm wearing right now, right? This is a costume. I, I don't have the red shirt on anymore because it's kind of cool where I'm at. Um, and uh, I let my mom drive the heating here because it's her house. So for me, it's kind of cold. So I've got a long sleeve shirt that's, you know, up here. Um, and that's on purpose. I, I, I tried several different colors and looked at them under the camera and decided which one I liked. And that's why I have the white one. Maybe that the white one is putting too much brightness on my face. I don't know. But I didn't want a short sleeve shirt, shirt anymore. And the darker ones didn't seem like they worked very well. So again, a costumer who is doing a good job probably a limited budget maybe having to get some of these costumes out of from who knows where but still works very well supports the characters and uh, it contributes to this feeling that they are who they are so. in the music department here uh, music is by leonard salzedo who um, had an imdb 1952 with to 1980 with a huge giant gap between 1958 this film and 1980 when he did an episode of hammer house of horror which was a 1980 tv series I haven't seen that assume it was an anthology series from the way it sounds so a very large gap in there 12 composer credits and three music department credits and his music was then used as stock film in uh, music in three different films and he also has two soundtrack credits and no awards uh, his music here, it's fine. Um, he's not a guy I've ever heard that trips over into that where I talk about it being maestro level. You know, what these guys do on it when they're doing music for films and TV, they're doing exactly the same thing that commissioned people like Mozart and Beethoven were doing. They were getting paid by the aristocracy and the royalty of the time. These guys are getting paid by a piece of the action or upfront cash for a movie that they're doing. But the work they're doing is exactly the same. You know, if you look at like uh, Mozart and Salieri, you know, Mozart, maestro, Salieri, not so much. Um, this guy would fall into the Salieri low, you know, area. Good at what he's doing, makes good use of the time and the budget that he has, but the music is while it supports the action just fine because you know i would have noticed if it didn't you know if you had a music cue that just didn't work so he's doing fine here with that you know an example by the way of music cue that does not work in uh, the first episode of star trek the next generation when they separate the saucer they reuse 
the theme from the show itself. That did not fit that moment. And the, the, uh, the composer on that one, I think it was David McCarthy, might be wrong. The composer on that one actually composed a specific um, cue to go along with that, a specific piece. And you can hear it on the soundtrack album, a uh, soundtrack uh, CD album uh, streaming. It's there. Um, he clearly wrote something for that. And I think what Gene Roddenberry says is, no, no, we want to reuse that thing. We want to make it sound big and grand. <laughs> and it does not fit. It does not fit at all with that moment. There's nothing like that in this film. Everything fits. Everything fits. It's just that nothing jumps out at me as being really memorable. It just all fits. My God, it's 1925, and I'm come up on the end of the review. We ask ourselves at this point, is it any good? Oh, yes, yes. Retconning aside, you know, difficult believing the body just being there at the end and a few things like that. Um, as I said, it's not retreading the first film, and it's not retreading other Frankenstein movies. We'd get that in the next movie, Evil Frankenstein. Um, it is going off in its own direction. It is like watching a continuation of the adventure, but having that adventure in your backstory, pretty much, with the exception of the retcons, uh, having that, uh, that adventure story, in, that other story in your backstory, but going off and doing your own thing. Didn't see that much in either Frankenstein or other horror films, you know. Frankenstein's monster was always Frankenstein's monster in Universal and eventually turned into it in the next film here. Dracula was always kind of Dracula, you know, and the Wolfman was always kind of the Wolfman. The mummy's always kind of the mummy. If you have a stereotypical notion in your head of what that looks like, yeah, probably it came out of Universal. So when you see something like this, it's going off in a completely different direction. It is not retreading the movie. It isn't going into any aspect of the book. It's just saying, okay, let's take these characters and do the next thing with them. I like that a lot. Uh, very different direction. And as I say, the twist at the end was a surprise to me when I saw it, which is unusual. I like when movies can do that, so I give it some credit. Would I recommend it? Yes. It is definitely worth watching um, because it's a very different Frankenstein movie. Just make sure you don't watch the next one. Um, Evil of Frankenstein is so bad. Oh, everything about it is bad. Where this one, you can probably say they didn't have much time and maybe had a little bigger budget than the last one. The next one, you go, good God, you know, where did that makeup artist go? Because the makeup on the monster is horribly bad. Not anything like the first movie and certainly not like what we can see here, which is, you know, largely functional. Oh, God. the evil of Frankenstein is terrible. Don't watch it. This one, yes. Watch this one. You know, once every once in a while. It's not something you go, hey, let's watch, you know, the, the Revenge of Frankenstein. Oh, well, you know, it's not like Star Wars Episode Four. I'll watch it any time you want me to put it in. Um, but this is a movie you should watch, and, you know, for historical and the fact that it goes off in its own direction, which is kind of nice. Kind of nice. I think I'm going to have an actual two-hour show this time. See what happens when I don't spend all of this time setting context? I actually have a two-hour show. <laughs> um, a bit of news. Now, I'm probably going to pull out, pull out this next as a clip. So I have found that it's useful in clips to have a brief moment of silence of two or three seconds. So here we go. Okay, to talk about the Kavanaugh situation, because that's on everybody's mind. I did not watch the uh, hearing last week. Larry Larry is saying, I hate, uh, they keep calling Star Wars Episode Four. Yeah, it sounds totally unnatural to me. I use it only just to differentiate it. To me, it's the first Star Wars movie, Star Wars. For me, it didn't have a crawl that said Episode Four at the front of it. It was just Star Wars with the opening crawl and nothing else. So, yeah, I totally agree. I just like when they call it Episode 4, too, but I understand why they do it. If you just say Star Wars, today's fans probably don't know you're talking about that one. It's a concession you have to make to the age of the people out there now. But the Kavanaugh situation. I did not watch the hearings because I figured, what's the point? Really? What would be the point of watching those hearings? Um, you know, it's a he said, she said. And whoever was going into those thinking that Kavanaugh was guilty 
walked out of them thinking Kavanaugh was guilty. Whoever walked in thinking he was getting railroaded walked out thinking he was getting railroaded. If I'd watched it, I know I would have walked out thinking he was railroaded because I think he's being. Uh, point you to my Fandai Masters discussion of MGDOW and the Kavanaugh railroading, which I have a link to down below. And uh, the fact that we had these at all is one of the reasons I tend to lean toward MGTOW. Because when you get into sexual assault and you get into rape or anything else, the assumption is that the person being accused is guilty and you must prove your innocence. And that's exactly what was happening here. And now they're calling in the FBI to investigate again. What are they going to find here? You know, everybody that I've heard about refutes the story. Now we have two nut jobs who came forward and said they were the actual rapist. How they could both be the rapist, I do not know. But two of them, I think they're just nut jobs, the kind of cranks that you get. They've come forward. But they're not going to find any evidence. They're not going to find any evidence of this. It's, you know, it's too old. You can't, after 36 years, find any evidence. It's just impossible. This is ultimately a he said, she said circumstance. And I do not believe that you should ever be assumed guilty. You should be assumed innocent, and it is the job of the person who thinks they're the victim for them to be able to come forward and prove that you did something. For me, it's a he said, she said situation. In that situation, you must presume innocence until proven guilty, and nobody can prove this, not ever. As I said when I talked about MGTOW before, ladies, two things. One, this has now put me in a frame of mind. This and knowing about all of the other false allegations that happened has put me in the frame of mind of not believing you when you come forward unless, unless you have gone to the police when it happened, that you went to the hospital when it happened so that they could gather forensic evidence and then you are able to prove that something happened. That's one of the main reasons you do it. The other one is... It's to protect other women. Because if the rapist or the sexual assault guy gets away with it with you, they're going to go and do it again and get away with somebody else. If you do not report them, if you do not report the crime and go after them, that's on you. That's on you. It's not on me. If you let the guy go, you let the guy go. So go and get evidence. And once you have evidence, then I will believe you. Right now, my default position probably would be to not believe you. And that means if you're I'm on your jury, you are going to have to prove to me. I will not automatically assume. My automatic assumption from now on is that the man is innocent until proven guilty. And if you're on the other side for that, if you think the guy should be uh, presumed guilty until he proves he's innocent, you are ejecting. One of the major tenets that has held Western society together. We must always, under all circumstances, including rape, assume that the accused is innocent until he can be proven guilty. And if you can't prove it and you, it actually happened, then you have a problem. You should have done something more about it to get that forensic evidence. It's not that hideously hard to get. You just have to do it when it happens. You can't wait 36 years. That's insanity. And if you are on the side, somebody who should, thinks he should be uh, guilty until proven innocent, you're ejecting one of the major core things about Western society that has made Western society. Don't do that. Innocent until proven guilty under all circumstances. Uh, Larry Larry says they're delaying his getting the Supreme Court. Uh, it's, uh, it's the only reason. Yeah. Oh, this is just... As I said before, and the other one I did, transparent attempt by Democrats to stall a Supreme Court justice um, uh, getting appointed and solely because they think they're going to take the next election, the midterms, and then they'll be able to put it on hold more or less indefinitely or keep saying no until you know Trump comes up with somebody that's liberal enough that they find palatable. Yes, it is totally just delaying things. There's one other issue about this that I was struck by. And that was when I saw a video called a U2 Brett Kavanaugh 
by a guy who has a channel that goes by an ear for men. He used to be a voice for men, but then he got kicked off YouTube. <laughs> um, that video, you can see I've got a link to it down below. Um, I definitely suggest you watch that because he had a point on there that I had not thought about until I saw it. And his point was this. These sorts of base, baseless allegations happen a lot more frequently than you think. I will not talk about my own personal experience, but I can talk about other things, things I've heard. You know, accusations of domestic violence, of child abuse, particularly during a divorce, are incredibly common, and they're baseless. But the problem is the man is always presumed guilty until he proves himself innocent. And so when a woman makes those charges, the guy is usually just up the creek without a paddle. There is nothing else, nowhere to go from that. Um, I think, and this is also, Ear for Men guy mentioned this, I, I think it's always useful to remember, and this is a true statement. Ask yourself this, because it's true. The only thing that people feel for broken men is contempt. And you may say, well, that's a little much, but then think about it. Just ask yourself this question. If you see a man living with his dog under a bridge, True or false, you feel sorry for the dog. That's where men in when it comes to the justice system. It is so badly stacked against them that any accusations of that sort of thing means that the man will not be seeing his kids, except maybe visit with supervised visitation, and all because women, when you get into divorce, make baseless accusations all the time. Now, are some of them real? Sure but they're impossible to tell the difference from, from baseless accusations. It's why you always assume innocent until proven guilty, and that includes sexual assault, um, claims of domestic violence, claims of, of child abuse. They're all oftentimes completely made up, particularly when you're getting into divorce situations. So I would say, you know, go and watch Paul Elam, he's from A Voice for Men. I got the link down there. I think he does a really good job of explaining it because all of this happens very frequently, a lot more frequently than you think. And what's happening to Kavanaugh now is not unusual from that perspective. You know, getting, uh, I mean, the reason that they did it is because it works. You know, baseless accusations of sexual assault work. Um, so that's why they're doing it. And what's going to happen here is Kavanaugh is going to walk away and he's going to say to himself, well, that was a nightmare. I assume he's going to get appointed, but he, he was going to walk his way and say, okay, that was a nightmare, but it was a one-off. They did it because they wanted to, you know, prevent me from getting it, et cetera. And he's going to say, okay, well, done with that, you know, wash my hands. He's not going to be thinking about all the men that this happens to every fracking day in this country. And it would be nice if a justice, particularly a judge on the Supreme Court, actually thought about that stuff from time to time, that maybe some of what they're hearing is totally baseless. Um, and that's kind of the biggest tragedy for me. He's going to walk away from this and wash his hands of it, and he's not going to think about all the other men who are in exactly the same circumstance because he thinks this is a one-off. He thinks this is a power play one-off, which it was definitely, it is a power play thing, but it's not so much of a one-off. So Kavanaugh, if you're watching, keep that in mind when you're making decisions on the Supreme Court, innocent until proven guilty, not just you, but all of the other men who are accused often baselessly for what they've done. Okay, a couple of, couple of seconds for a, a, bit of, uh, a bit of pause there, because again, uh, what I find is it's useful when I'm doing these and I'm taking out of clips to leave a little space in before and after so I have some time to fade in and out. Another bit of news in the tech world. We have yet another Facebook breach. Um, there is a bug that could be exploited to take control, and apparently was, of 50,000 accounts. It was uh, what we're kind of calling the view as bug. On Facebook, you can sh you know, have it show you what your page looks like to other friends, to the world in general. You do a view as. Well, turns out there was a bug in that. 50,000 users got hacked. 
Yeah, I don't know who. I'm not sure they know for sure. Change your password on Facebook. For that matter, why the hell are you still on Facebook? It leaks like a sieve, as I've said many times. The business model requires sharing of data, whether you know it or not, via public APIs that any competent programmer can use. I'm sorry, you're absolutely right, Larry. It's 50 million, not 50,000. I missed. I, I've got notes up behind the camera because I have no, I have no uh, uh, teleprompter, so I, I misread it. But you're right, 50 million accounts, 50 million, and that's just the most recent leaking like a sieve. And as I say, their business model requires sharing of data. Any competent programmer can do it. The environment, as I've said, is toxic. It leads to people having uncivil behavior. It's not like, you know, the days when you had to care if the person next to you felt bad or wanted to punch you out. It's just like, okay, let's pile on. Doesn't matter. Uh, it also encourages creating um, little bubbles for yourself of people who believe like-minded people and you never hear the other side ever, which also encourages people to believe that the other side is evil. I honestly think that with the vast majority of people, what you have to understand is they are just trying to do something that makes things better from their perspective. Now, I think usually they're wrong, but they're not evil. You know, it's not like the left constantly calling the right, you know, racist, bigoted, etc., etc., etc. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. They thought they were doing the best thing they could when they voted for Trump. I didn't because I'm a libertarian, but I, got, I have lots of conservative friends who basically kind of held their nose and they went, well, it's not great, you know, but definitely better than Clinton. <laughs> uh, just trying to do what they think is best. Probably doesn't work most of the time. It certainly hasn't in my lifetime, neither side, but they're trying to do what's best. Facebook is also a leftist platform. People only, the people left of Che Guevara can prosper. Everybody else gets jumped on and kicked off and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And as I many have said in the, my clip that I pulled out that says Facebook and Twitter are brainwashing you, it is contributing to a dopamine addiction that you probably don't know you have. Consider this. The people who are boards, board members and creators and stuff of the platforms, Facebook and Twitter, do not allow their own children to use it. They know exactly what's happening. They don't want their children to get dopamine addiction, which is what's going on. For God's sake, why are you still using Facebook? Get off. Your life will be better. I've been without Facebook, I guess, better part of the year now. And I, uh, my life outlook is much, much, much brighter than it used to be. Get off. Get off. It's terrible. A bit of science fiction news. Kathleen Kennedy's contract was renewed for uh, Lucasfilm. She is here until 2021 or 2022. I've forgotten. I don't get it. <laughs> I just don't get it. She has been overseeing the absolute downfall of the Star Wars franchise. Why is she still employed? My assumption was that they were going to get rid of her as soon as they could figure out a way to do it with all the feminine, without the feminists screaming at them. Just incompetent. You know, you just look at the current trilogy. She went into it with no plan whatsoever. You don't do that with a trilogy, a moron. Now, one hopes one hopes that probably, hopefully, there was some kind of conversation between her and Iger that said, okay, we're going to let you back for another three or four years. And what you got to do is clean up your act. Stop trying to be SJW and shoving everything into movies that nobody wants to see. Make good movies. Stop denigrating your fans when they hate your fracking movies. Don't do the same stuff that you've been doing until now. Shape up and fly right, and we'll talk to you again in 2022. I hope that that's what happened. If I were Iger, that's what I would have said. If I didn't think I could just dump her ass right now, that's what I would have said. You got to make some concessions. You got to do things differently from what you've been doing because it's been blowing up in our faces. We got to do it differently. I hope that conversation went on. 
Uh, Larry there says, no bad decision goes unrewarded in Hollywood. Yes, you always have to wonder when you see some of the crap they put out, who greenlit this stuff? You know, particularly when you're doing with fa science fiction and superheroes. For God's sake, guys, just, just call me. Hell, I have written down how I would fix the DC Cinematic Universe or DC Extended Universe, whatever the hell you want to do it. I've got it written down. I got some time at the end here, I think. And I'm going to read it out to you. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I've written down, how to fix it. Guys at Warner Brothers, I'm giving this one to you. I've usually said, call me, I'll tell you how, but at the end of the episode, I will give you this one. Uh, Disney was too frightened to dump her. I think that's very possible. I think it's very possible. I mean, if they did, SJWs and the Feminists would be all over them. The fact that she's clearly driving a billion-dollar property into the ground would not matter to them. You know, They would not be able to see it as purely a business decision, which is what I would think of it as. I don't care if she's a man or a woman. She, driving this into the ground, it's time to get her out and get somebody in who isn't. But I think feminists and SJWs would probably go ape crap. And that's probably why, as you say, Larry, Larry, they were too frightened to dump her. I think that's probably true. I'd mentioned that Doctor Who is coming back this weekend on October 7th. I'm looking forward to that. Um, you know, people are worried that maybe it's going to be an SJW thing, but I don't think it necessarily is. Depends how they do it. Um, there will be two episodes this week and next week that I will then be reviewing a week after next. Um, I, I kind of wish I was going to be around to review this one, and I probably will be watching it when I'm out on Family Ranch Land. Um, I, I use my phone for data out there, and there's no reason I wouldn't be able to stream this episode. So I probably will. If I have something really specific to say about it, I'll hop on and do it right after I do the episode. Because when I see the episodes, hours before anybody else sees them. Hours. Because I do not wait for it to come out on BBC. Well, I do. An hour after it airs on BBC, there are streams. And uh, I don't watch it on BBC America because they chop out pieces of it randomly so they can fit in commercials. Sometimes major plot points. I've seen them do it. So I don't watch their crap. I wait until somebody just has taken the thing off the BBC website, which they do, in Great Britain, and it shows up at streaming sites I go to. So I will see it within just, you know, hours before anybody else will. And if I have something specific to say about that episode, and I might, I will get on and do a live stream on Saturday or Sunday. I'm going to be live streaming from out of my family ranch land anyway. Uh, Larry Larry says, Kathleen Kennedy using her gender to stay employed. Yeah. I think probably Iger and Disney rue the day that they let a woman into that position. See, ladies, this is another way you're fracking it up, right? We got a woman in here, and I don't care if she's female. It's irrelevant to me. It's a business decision. She's making poor business decisions, and yet you can't fire her for fear of social justice warriors coming after you. This means that when it comes time to replace her, she doesn't get it straightened out. You don't dare put a woman in that position precisely because it's impossible to get rid of her. That means feminists, gals, ladies, you're screwing things up for yourselves. You've got to be able to acknowledge when you have an incompetent female. You want competent females in those positions. If you fail to do that, not going to be inclined to get another woman because it's fracking impossible to get rid of them. So as I say, Doctor Who's coming back. to be two and two episodes of that when I come back. And uh, maybe I'll do a live stream if I have something specific to say about it the moment it happens. And I might. Very well might. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We also have Star Trek Discovery coming back in January uh, with four minisodes to be done before that. I will certainly review the first night, of the first episode of it. Um, maybe I, and I'll do... I'll do many reviews, just as I'm going to do with Doctor Who. I'll do many reviews as time goes on uh, in my other episodes. Um, so I am, I can't say I'm looking forward to it. I just like the program so much in the first season. Who knows? Maybe they'll do something I like. <laughs> we'll just have to see. Let me get up um, that document I was talking about where I've actually written down how to fix the DC Universe on film. And I'm going to give it to you guys um, because I think it's just marginally that important. <laughs> I will give it to you. I will give you a plan for the entire DC Universe that you can use to fix it. Pardon me while I'm moving stuff around so that I can see this. 
I have it as notes. Okay, so here is how I would fix DC in the movie world. And yes, DC, I'm just going to give it to you. You don't have to call me. I am giving up a potential fortune here, but I want to see good movies in the DC film multiverse. So here's what you do. To start out with, you stay the hell away from everybody at the beginning except Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. And you say right off the bat that these three superheroes in this universe debuted on their original cover dates. So Superman, for example, June of 1938 is when he made his first appearance in this movie, in this universe. Now this means with these three characters that you can do lots of World War II period shows and, uh, and uh, movies. It doesn't necessarily mean you follow the comics. And, you know, what I might do with these characters, actually, these three characters have always fared better on TV than they have in films. I would have these big three on their own uh, TV series, turn it over to the guys who are doing the DC products on TV because they know what they're doing. And you do this as nothing but period shows. All three of them are period shows. And maybe you have the occasional standalone movie, but they're all period shows. And that's where you start with. These three characters were 40s era World War II characters, and they work much better in that context than they do today. So you start out with them as appearing originally on their cover dates, and you go from there. Now, the thing about these three characters is you can say they don't age, even Batman. I mean, Superman is an alien of unknown peak power. And what we would say in this universe is that he gets more powerful as time goes on. In fact, he may be, if you did it right, the linchpin that holds everything together. What you can do is first say, like they did in the comics, he can leap one-eighth of a mile, but by the 1940s, he's flying. By the 1970s, he's virtually invulnerable. And by um, 3018, because I'm going to continue the Justice League all the way through from the 1940s to then, you say by 3018, he has become a Yagla. What we say in Star Trek is yet another godlike alien. Q-like. That level of power. And almost never on Earth. And in 2018, or whenever we start these films up, everybody is just guessing where his peak power will be. Um, and we'll also say that Superman and Lois had been married since the 1950s, and, or maybe earlier, and that they raised Kara Zor-El when her rocket crashed on Earth. Um, we'll say again that she became a power girl, because we already have a supergirl going on in the, uh, on TV. We'll call her power girl so as not to you know, be able to differentiate them. Uh, Larry Larry says, Tim and Dini, yes, very similar to that, except as I say, we start out in the 1940s. These three characters start in the 1940s, and they just don't age. Now we can say, in the modern times, well, Lois Lane's too old. Yeah, well, let's say that she just died in the 2010s of old age. And up to that point, Superman had been masquerading as aging. Now what you have to remember about Superman is he's a great actor. Clark Kent must be a brilliant actor, or else nobody would buy the glasses. It's one of the things that uh, Christopher Reeve did right. He said, okay, Superman has to be a good actor. Otherwise, nobody's going to buy these glasses. Um, however, we say Lois Lane recognized him the very first time he saved her. Really, if we, what we could say is, you know, if we're getting away with this, we can say most people don't even see Superman's face, let alone Clark Kent's face ever. ever. So how would they know? And, and she's not that stupid. Lois isn't that stupid. So sometime in the early, you know, 1938, you'd say the initial debut in, in the comic Superman, you know, she meets Clark Kent and then later on Superman in the issue saves her. We just say, hey, wait a minute. You're Clark Kent. You know, I mean, just let it go off the top. She's not that stupid. We're going to do it a little more realistically. So, as I say, we just say, okay, well, people almost never see Clark Kent or Superman's face, so how would they put it together? You wouldn't necessarily. However, we also say that Clark's Daily Planet colleagues do know. You know, Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, again, reporters, they're not stupid. They, they see both of their faces from time to time, and a pair of glasses doesn't fool them for a moment. But what they do do is keep up the appearance that they don't know. We can say there's this rule. The first rule of Superman's secret is you don't talk about Superman's secret. So maybe Jimmy Olsen and, and Perry White know, but they don't talk to each other about it. So they both know, but they don't know the other people know. Again, first rule of Superman's secret, you don't talk about Superman's secret. 
So we can say after Lewis died in the 2010s, so Superman then returned. We could say he was off for a long time. You know, he got old. Lois did, and he went off to be with her, but then she died, and he came back. And he becomes the more or less permanent, ch permanent chairman of the Justice League, and he no longer keeps a secret identity. In fact, everyone knows he's Clark Kent, and people either call him Superman or Mr. Kent on the street, just interchangeably, and his friends all just call him Clark, and he spends most of his time at the Justice League satellite. Um, and his current era um, has, that we can use, the Justice League is also something we can use in this universe to jump off with. Again, as Larry Larry says, something a bit like what uh, Tim and Deanie did with the animated universe, except on steroids. We can say, okay, for, for standalone films, sometimes we can jump off from the Justice League. You know, Superman is spending all his time there. He's not a reporter anymore. That's long in the past. That's what we did in the 1940s for. And you can do the two concurrently. You can have the TV series that's happening in the 1940s and the current adventures at the same time because one is a period piece. It's rather like Agent Carter was, you know, those, those minisodes. You could do an entire series set in the 40s, the 50s, etc. Superman in the TV series played a, a bit with that secret identity similarly. Yeah, yeah. And this we just say by the 2000s after Lois is gone, and it's impossible really to keep much of a secret identity. He just ejected it. He said there's no point anymore, you know. But we can have the two things going on simultaneously, one in the series, one in movies. And occasionally we can have period movies if we want to without confusing the viewer. It'll be terribly obvious. But again, we can use the Justice League as a jumping off point for some of these. You know, maybe Superman says, okay, this guy in the league can't handle it. I'm short-handed. This looks like a job for Superman. And then he goes into his own film to do his thing. Um, and Wonder Woman. Now, of course, from the 1940s, she's an ageless Amazonian princess. The Amazonians don't age, period. So she can come as go as she likes. We'll say that she had her series in the 1940s, was active in World War II very specifically, you know, married Steve Trevor at some point, say he died in the 1990s, and Diana just went back to Paradise Island after that. And she only shows up in Justice League movies after that point as one of the big guns, you know, when something really terrible happens and they pull her out. Similarly, Batman. Now, the Lazarus Pit was not a story point that wasn't introduced in the comics in the 1970s, but there's no reason you can't introduce that all the way back in the 40s. All he has to do to keep staying alive is take an occasional dip in the Lazarus Pit, and he will be brought back up. But at the same time, you can say that uh, between, say, 1960 or 80 or so, maybe he was retired, you know, you, you just get after a while, you know, uh, in the comics on Earth 2, Bruce Wayne became police commissioner of Gotham City PD when Jim, when Jim Gordon retired. Give him that role. And then we say, okay, um, Robin grew up, and now you, he did not become Nightwing. He didn't, turn, he didn't take over for Batman. He's just the adult Robin. He's no longer Robin the Boy Wonder. He's just adult Robin. Um, however, also in the comics on Earth 2, Bruce Wayne married Selina Kyle and had a daughter who uh, was uh, um, Helena Wayne. So if you ever hear, you know, Helena and the uh, Huntress today, that comes straight out of the, the uh, tail end of the Silver Age and when they had Earth 2 Batman marrying Earth 2 Selina Kyle, the Catwoman. So you could have Robin partner with Huntress. She's much younger. So instead of Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder, you have Robin and Huntress the Girl Wonder. And you can keep having them grow up this way. We're talking about a period from the 1940s all the way up to 2010s. So we're going to have characters, even Robin is going to get too old by that period. So you can have Huntress grow up. And maybe there is a uh, still ageless Batman running around. Maybe you could say Huntress was killed at some point in the 1990s and Batman came around. And uh, so maybe it's Huntress's daughter. And you can have Batman and Batgirl the girl wonder. See, guys? See, you just have to have a plan. So by 2018, well, Batman's still around. Nobody knows his secret identity. He's kept it all this time. He is ageless because of going to the Lazarus Pit. And he has Batwoman, formerly Batgirl, still around. They don't usually operate together, however. As adults, they just live in different places and live different lives, as adults actually do. So Batwoman, well, I'll just say that she operates in New York City outright. Then we have the Justice League. As I say, I think there are two linchpins that could hold this whole universe together. 
One of them is the Justice League. Now we can say, you know, in the, in the comics, we had the Justice Society of America in the 1940s, but then the Justice League came along in the 1960s. Clearly, you know, uh, when they were coming up with the Justice League, they had Justice Society in mind. They just thought League sounded more dramatic. So let's just say the Justice Society starts out right in um, Justice League, rather, starts out right in the 1940s and continues uninterrupted all the way up to the 30th century, 31st century. Um, we replace the Justice Society with it. And we say that uh, members of the JSA appeared on their cover dates. They appeared in this universe for the first time on their actual cover dates. And the initial roster of this would be, would be like the Adam, the first Adam, Ray Pratt, Al Pratt, rather. Um, we'll say, unlike, see, in the 1940s, he was a short guy, like 5'2 or something like that. And he was very, very strong and a good fighter. Here we say, let's make him a little bit smarter. And we'll say he came up with the shrinking technology, but he can only get down to four inches. So he can go from 5'2 to smaller and to about four inches. He can't get tiny, tiny infinitesimal, but about four inches. Um, and he's short to start with. Then we have the Sandman, who has basically the same powers and ability and has a uh, teenage sidekick or maybe younger. We can play with this. We can play with making some of these sidekicks like Robin, only 10 years old. Let's try it. See how that works in the 1940s. Um, we have Hawkman, the Carter Hall version, the reincarnated version. Um, and there's Nth Metal that comes from ancient Egypt somehow. We can fill that out in other movies if you want to. And Carter and his wife, Shiara Hall, are the only ones who have this. Um, they do not survive the entire time. They get old. Um, but somebody else takes over for him in the 1970s and more uh, complex, more technological wings that they wear. But the, um, the uh, nth metal belts are still around. And we can say that maybe Carter and Chiara lived until the 2010s, died of natural causes. Dr. Fate would have the same powers as in the Golden Age, and he can be around till the present. He is essentially um, Nabu the Wise of ancient Egypt. By the way, we could say the reincarnated uh, Carter Hall knew him in ancient Egypt, for that matter. And he, is wi he and his wife just simply don't age because they're magical. They just don't age, so they're around. There's our man who have the same powers as the Golden Age. He has a chemical that gives him super, super strength for an hour. And then we have the Flash. We're gonna change him around a bit. The Flash in the Golden Age was Jay Garrick. We will say this time around that it is just Barry Allen. The only Flash this universe is ever going to have is Barry Allen. He is initially a police scientist, as he was in the Silver Age. And after he becomes the Flash, now the interesting thing was the Flash in the Golden Age never kept a secret identity, never kept one at all. People would see him playing tennis with himself, for example. Um, people, he didn't have a mask, he just had a hat. He never kept a secret identity. So we say Barry Allen is not keeping a secret identity. He worked initially in the Central City Police Department, but then after he came out as a superhero, they made him a captain and basically just allowed him to work. So he actually works for the police catching these crooks. Um, we give him the same powers as the Golden Age Jay Garrick. He's not as fast as he would get. We're getting in this progression. Heroes get more and more stronger and faster as they age. So he grows his speed over time and he's going to stay around to the current era because of Einstein's theory. The faster and more often he goes, he ages less. It is exactly what we see with Einstein's theory. He ages less the faster he goes. Then we have Green Lantern. Going to change him around a bit too. Now, Green Lanterns, the cool things about them is that they belong to the Green Lantern Corps. They are going to provide, they and the Legion of Superheroes in the future are going to provide the science fiction in this universe. The core is what it should mostly be about. However, um, the Silver Age goal, uh, Green Lantern uh, Alan Scott had a magic ring. It was not associated with the Green Lanterns at all. We're going to fix that, going to change it, going to change it up a bit. We're going to say Abin Sewer was the alien that crashed on Earth and gave Hal Jordan his ring. Crashed on Earth on uh, uh, the cover date for Alan Scott's first adventure in July of 1940. And we do it in such a manner as the power battery is damaged. It'll self-repair, but it won't, won't be finished until 1962. So Alan, Sir, uh, Alan Scott never knows who Abin Sir is. What happened was the ring went to look for a replacement on Earth. It could not go off Earth because the power battery it was associated with did not have the means to get off Earth. 
And this is why it can go look for Alan Scott. He has no idea where this stuff comes from. As far as he's concerned, it's a freaking golden uh, a magic ring. And the, the, what happens, we establish it that's similar to what we saw in the, in, the, in the first Green Lantern movie that sucked. When you go to Oa, it isn't just for training. It's to bind the ring to the wearer. So because Alan Scott never had that, he was using the ring only to a fraction of its full potential. Now we say Alan Scott maybe was killed in 1959 in some kind of uh, heroic fashion, maybe on a Justice League mission. And then the ring found Hal Jordan as a replacement. And at first, Hal Jordan even goes around in, um, in Alan Scott's costume, which was very different from a Green Lantern uh, uniform. But then the ring fixes itself in 1962 and immediately takes Hal off to Oa, where we find out all he finds all about this backstory, and it allows us to then get into science fiction stories in the modern day. Um, and when he comes back, he's got you know the ring firmly bonded to him. Um, he has full control over all of its uh, amazing abilities. It is the most powerful weapon in the known universe. Really, a Green Lantern ring is the most powerful weapon in the known universe. And so we say, okay, now it's all self-repaired. He is all set. And when he comes back, he's got his uh, standard Green Lantern uniform, and he is now Green Lantern number 2814, the Green Lantern assigned to the entire sector of space in Guardian Space, in which Earth resides. So his adventures will not generally be on Earth. They will be either standalone science fiction adventures out in space, or Green Lantern core adventures, where you bring in a whole bunch of them for a movie. Now, we have to build a backstory here because it'll f factor in uh, to a lot of the movies. We say that unknown to Earth, Guardian space uh, is more or less any sector in which Green Lanterns have been stationed. They have the most powerful weapon in the universe. Almost no one even ever tries with Green Lanterns because for thousands of years they've been doing this. Um, not even interstellar wars are allowed to happen inside of Guardian Space because Green Lanterns, either alone or in a group, can stop them. And we can see some of these in movies if we want to. We can say that, uh, that uh, Guardian Space is not a galactic government. Say it only has about a quarter of the galaxy in 1962. So that allows us the ability to occasionally have battles with other races who do not want the GLs and Guardians around. And Earth, it's inconsequential. <laughs> We're not a spacefaring species, so it does, we don't, you know, nobody cares to a large extent, except when they finally found out the truth that they're not actually um, running in their own show. You know, we can say, okay, also we can bring Hal in for, uh, we'll say he's still alive, you know, getting kind of old and gray, but still around and still in charge of the most powerful weapon in the universe, which means we have Justice League movies set in the modern day. You can call him back for really horrible emergencies, you know, planetary danger or larger, and that's all. Mostly, he's going to be science fiction adventures off uh, Earth. So. But maybe when Dark Side comes, we can call him back. We would say of our, of our uh, roster, uh, it would change a lot over the years. By 2018, they built a satellite, and the League is essentially international. Technically, anyone with a mask is a member of the Justice League, whether you like it or not. They can grab anybody at any time from anywhere in the world if they think they have a power that will work. And this gives us the ability to spin off standalone movies. You know, Superman's up there, and he's saying, huh, um, looks to me like Firestorm would work for this one. Call Firestorm new movie right there um, we can jump right off from those the justice league is a linchpin we can jump off all kinds of springboards for all kinds of things for minor characters for tv programs and film um, and in the big battles dark side shows up everybody shows up <laughs> Now, the League can have its own subgroups. It's such a large thing that maybe some of the people got together and have their own little subgroups. So for example, the Seven Soldiers of Victory, who were uh, active in the 40s and 50s. The Freedom Fighters, also active in the 40s and 50s. The All-Star Squadron, which at the time it was made was a big clearinghouse, much like I'm talking about here, but we'll just call it a subgroup in this universe. And then the Titans, who are younger, here, uh, uh, is a team of younger heroes that are generally partners of the adult members, just as the Teen Titans originally and always tends to have always been. And you make those guys a sub-team, 
which means that sometimes they'll be acting on their own and maybe the league will call them up and say, we need you to go do this. Your powers are good for this uh, thing we need. We can springboard off of the league. It is one of the leech linchpins. Then we say, in the future, where we're going to get more of our science fiction adventures, a thousand years in the future, by 3118 or thereabouts, there is a subgroup of the Justice League which has continued on to the present day, uh, that day, that is a group of teenagers, younger heroes, some of whom will be partners of adult League heroes, and some of whom, like the original Legion of Superheroes, are taken from different worlds. They don't. The, on the power is not a power on their own world because everybody has it. When you take them off world and put them together, then you've got something interesting. So we can have the Legion as a subgroup of the 31st century Justice League. We also might say that by that point, the Guardians have moved out. They've taken over about a third of the galaxy. And what they do is the smart thing that the Romans used to do. They do not directly meddle in local affairs. You can manage your local and planetary affairs, and even to some extent interplanetary affairs, all you want. But they will not allow interstellar wars, and they will require free trade between those places. Run your place any way you want to, but the moment you get off planet, then you have to abide by our rules. And the Green Lanterns enforce it, <laughs> because they have the most powerful weapon in the universe. You want to go and have a war? Well, they're going to stop you. Um, and again, we can have lots of science fiction adventures by the 30th century where we can have people, you know, either doing on or off planet adventures. Then we have our supervillains. Well, of course, there's Lex Luthor. And we say, okay, he debuted on his cover date in the 1940s. And he is a mad scientist, not a villain. Lex Luthor always works better when he's a mad scientist. When he's anything else, like a businessman, he eventually becomes a mad scientist. Let's just say, Lex Luthor works better as a mad scientist and go from there. He is a constant thorn in Superman's side, even up to 2018, because he gets to survive. Because he, long ago, figured out the Lazarus Pit and how to reproduce it scientifically. He's the only one allowed to use it, but he can do that. And he has known that Superman is Clark Kent since the 1940s. However, he had a visit from Batman and, Super and Wonder Woman that inspired him to keep his mouth shut all the way uh, up until Superman came back and stopped using a secret identity. And we can have maybe a standalone Superman movie set in the 1940s where post credits we can have Lex Luthor figuring it out and then Batman and Wonder Woman show up <laughs> and say, you're not going to say a damned word to anyone. We have the Joker, of course. We must have the Joker. What we do, though, is we say there's more than one. Um, they happen in succession. There's never more than one of them happening at the same time. But Batman, despite being the greatest detective on Earth, and by the way, the TV series would focus on that. In the 1940s, he's not freaking Iron Batman. He's a guy in a costume who's really, really good um, a fighter and in peak physical condition and the greatest detective on Earth. But even though the greatest detective on Earth, he couldn't figure out who the Joker is, why they do this stuff. Now, we might explore that in a TV series or standalone films, but the viewer can know, but Batman never gets on. I would envision the very first Joker to be very similar to the way Jack Nicholson's portrayal was in the Batman movie. You know, somebody who was a thug, who had an accident, and is now a nut job. And uh, we get this, you know, thorn in the side of what we call sort of the Batman family of characters all the way up to the present day. It just kind of goes one after the other. Um, and nobody knows how the hell it happens or why. Maybe we don't even tell the viewer. It's just mysterious. This constantly happens. One person to the next, and we don't know why. There's Batman's rogues gallery. Well, we can most say most of them uh, come around. Um, various ones are active at different periods in time, so we can certainly do that. But they eventually just die or give up. Selina Kyle, of course, Bat Catwoman, she reforms, marries Bruce Wayne. We could say she died sometime in the 1990s. We have Superman's other foes, again, very similar to Batman. Most of them are active only in a given period, um, so it works out for the larger universe itself. And they all just die or give up eventually, and, uh, except for Luthor, who will never give up. We have Flash's rogues gallery of villains. Well, again, same deal. They were generally operating during a specific time period. There was no one that the Flash ever had that was an arch nemesis, and I don't think you should change that. Nobody was ever an arch nemesis. Professor Zoom, the reverse Flash, 
came really close and did some stuff that was pretty nasty to him. But I wouldn't call him necessarily an arch nemesis. It's not somebody who started out from the golden age and just kept through all the way through. They can certainly be big bad guys. Um, but to be honest, I'd probably stay away from Professor Zoom. The TV series have touched that a lot. And by the way, we also say we acknowledge the TV series existences. We say these things happened in an alternate universe from this one. And we have this big universe I want to build, but the TV series, they're altering, uh, operating in alternate universes already. We just acknowledge it. These guys are in alternate universes from this big uh, universe that I'm creating. There is a Sinestro. Sinestro has been something of a thorn and, and almost an arch nemesis for Green Lantern since forever. Uh, we'll call him, however, a modern foe of Green Lantern, and we're going to give him the same powers as the Silver Age. He is a disgraced Green Lantern and the only one to have a yellow power ring. There are no multiple colors of power rings. That was a stupid idea, DC. Green and one power ring that is yellow in possession of Sinestro, whom he stole from the Quardians of Earth 2, because we have a multiverse here. This universe we'll call Earth 1 universe. There are no other lanterns aside from Green Lanterns and Sinestro. And Sinestro will manage to escape generally, but he is Green Lantern's villain in, stand in at least the first Green Lantern film and comes back uh, from time to time in standalones or other ways. And you can say he's caught from time to time and stuff like that, but he's one of those guys that always got out. <laughs> so, Green Lantern's other foes. We do not touch Parallax. Parallax sucked. It was a dumb idea, DC. Sucked, sucked, sucked. It exists solely for retcon purposes. We don't use him. We can have Green Lantern core movies, standalones that uh, maybe aren't real standalones, but uh, big space operas. Core could be fighting some kind of giant threat or aliens that are trying to frack things up around the galaxy. Um, but we'll always have Hal Jordan as a major focus of the film. So. Then we have our, our alternate universes, Earth 2 where the crime syndicate of America operates. This is an alternate universe. Say we found this guy in the 1940s. It was originally found in the 1970s. We'll put it back. Call it the 1940s so that you can have some Justice League movies in period 1940 that actually deal with them. And eventually you can say, somewhere down the line, the League eventually put them out of business. And by 2018, they're no threat whatsoever. However, also operating in Earth two, on Earth 2 universe is the Quardians. Um, this is where... Uh, Sinestro stole his, his yellow ring from. We can give it this backstory that this is the Quardians are known as the Weaponers of Quard. They make amazing weapons. So that's where how the Sinestro stole it from. It wasn't anything anybody made. He stole it from them because he was disgraced and still wanted his powers. And we can have the Quardians be occasional villains for the Green Lantern Court as well. Various other bad guys, um, you can have the Justice League Springboard the series, or you, uh, Springboard movies, maybe even Springboard TV series off of this. Um, and uh, the potential is really anywhere, anywhen. Anywhere from the 1940s all the way up through the 31st century, you can have all of these adventures. You can springboard them off the Justice League if you want to, or not. Doesn't matter. Just looks to me like the Justice League could be the linchpin that holds the entire universe together through the entire period. You can also do Dark Side, of course. Dark Side is the biggest, baddest villain ever. Um, standalone Justice League movies will deal with him because they would be epic. He operates out of a universe called Earth Three, which is an entirely alternate universe, and the natives never. And Earth there is Apocalypse, so we just stick him in his own alternate universe. He's a 2018 era villain. Um, his whole mission is to subjugate his entire universe, and then he learns of Earth One. Um, maybe. We can make it as an accident of another Justice League movie, so we get an after credit scene that shows Darkseid figuring out it exists. And then he decides he's going to conquer the Earth-1 universe as well. And we can do standalone movies with Justice League. We can do series that based on individual characters who fight him. Um, you know, there's individual characters who have always fought him. And he will be Superman's biggest standalone menace, absolutely, because he comes close to Superman's power in the 2018s. And then there are the other new gods, um, the guys who are fighting Darkseid and his minions. We can call them as coming from Earth-3 as well. So again, this is we acknowledge the existence of the multiverse. The TV series are happening in their own alternate universe. And we can cross them over, by the way. We can surprise the viewer um, at uh, one of the Justice League movies where it looks like they're getting completely screwed. 
And then we bring in Flash or Supergirl from these alternate universes and they save the day. And we could do that with this kind of universe, a multiverse. And again, we do, um, we do turn all of the TV properties over to the people doing TV right now because they know what the hell they're doing. We just say, here you go. Here is Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Go for that series. Make it a period 1940s piece. Uh, yes, hello, SuperGrew63. Pretty much done with the uh, review, but had some time at the end, so I figured, what the hell? I've already written out how I would fix the DC universe in films. I'm just going to do it. So I'm nearly the end, <laughs> amazingly enough. Then as another alternate universe, we have Earth-4. And this will be home to the Shazam family of characters. Now, I don't know if you can use their name for rights reasons. But if I were going to do it, if it was possible, this is where Captain Marvel would live. Not Shazam, that's the wizard. Captain Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel. We can say they started operating again in their 1940s on their cover dates. So by 2018, their alter egos are pretty fracking old and that they never change back to them. Because their characters as they are, Captain Marvel, Mary Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr., ageless. But their alter egos are old by then, and they don't dare change back. Just the lightning striking them could cause them to die. So we say they're old and they don't come back. Yep, Marvel is a problem. I know. Marvel Comics may own that. But I only re I can only think of the guy who says Shazam to turn into um, Captain Marvel. It's Captain Marvel. This is me saying if we could do it. I don't know. But we put them on their alternate universe because they and their entire pantheon have always worked with a different sort of tone. Um, we can give a bit more of a lighthearted comedic tone to that universe. You know? and, and all of these stories, by the way, different tones throughout. Justice League altogether will have one tone. Superman over here will have a different tone. Batman much darker. Wonder Woman very patriotic. You know? And we start all these guys in the 40s. Then we have Earth-5. We'll put the Charlton Comics characters that DC bought in the 1980s there. You know, people like Captain Atom and uh, Blue Beetle and um, um, those characters. They're all off in their own alternate universe. I think they work better there, too. Then we have Earth-6. Earth-6 would be home to the Watchmen characters. And we retcon the movie Watchmen as now being part of this giant multiverse. Whether or not you'd ever do any other movies in that continuity, I don't think you'd want to touch it. I think that works best as a standalone, and that's all about it. Just leave it alone. Supercruise 63 says, one of your co-workers told you they were talking about a black Superman. Ah, don't worry. They always talk about this crap for PR reasons. Superman died once, came back. I, I don't think anybody they got would last very long. Same deal. They've done it with Spider-Man. Different people have taken over, but it always goes back to the original. And I think that's what they do here eventually. It's just a big PR stunt. Then we consign the current DCEU stuff to another alternate universe and never touch it again because it sucks. We just consign it off to another universe, Earth-54, that we never touch. <laughs> We can, however, do Elseworlds. This is what they used to do in D.C. when they wanted to show something really interesting, like Superman crashing in the Soviet Union, you know, Batman being active in the 1880s. We can have all of these movies. We just say alternate universe over here, alternate universe over there. You know, um, we just make sure that we're, we're, we make sure we do what it is. And that brings me, uh, Supergroup 63 says, uh, from the series uh, Krypton, how uh, Zegel was messed with the uh, young Zod, who was a pretty black girl. Um, well, alternate universe. If I was going to do Zod, I'd... I'm honestly not sure if I would touch Zod. I might say that the 1970s movies are part of this universe. We might just say that Superman was active then, and he fought Zod and beat him. And that's all. We're done, because that movie isn't going to be outdone. Nobody's going to outdo that movie, not with giant special effects, nothing. That was a really well-made movie. Finally, we have what might be a biggest lynch... Yeah, Larry Sayer says, Earth-85, named after the crisis theater. There you go. Consign all the current ones over to Earth-85 and never touch them. But then we have what's quite possibly the biggest linchpin or pair of linchpins. As I said, you remember Superman has become super powerful. He's basically a Yagla. 
by the 31st century. So is Lex Luthor. And they have a war. It is called the Superman Luthor War, and it is waged throughout time and space. These are Yaglas. These are Q-level people. By this time, they have evolved, turned into, spent so much time. In Superman's case, it was just a natural thing. In Luthor's case, he was intentionally making himself more powerful as Superman got more powerful. So by the 30th century, they are essentially gods. And they have a war that spans all of time and space. And what you can do is show that this war is responsible for some of the more unlikely superheroes coming into existence. Flash, for example, right? Hit by a bolt of lightning with a bunch of chemicals spilled on it. Well, how likely is that going to turn you into super speed? Unless you have a godlike alien from the 31st century who is messing around. We can even do that with standalone uh, pictures. If you're going to spin off something, a springboard from the Justice League or whatever. Suppose you have Yagla Superman with a slight introduction. Or if you're going to do an Elseworlds where you're going to have Batman in the 1880s, have godlike Superman with some kind of minor introduction to tell the viewer that's what's going on. And you don't tell the viewer what the hell's going on with these voiceovers at the beginning of movies until you have the big, giant Justice League 31st century. That's when the Superman and Lex Luthor war bust out and you have this big, huge movie about it. Uh, Super Crew 63 says, Christopher Reeve is my Superman. Absolutely, mine too. Um, I'm reviewing that film in December on the anniversary of its release date. I have been working on that sucker for months. Little bits and pieces. Videos that I'm going to show. I've been working on that sucker for months. But yes, Chris Reeve is my Superman. Absolutely. I, I think he defined how the character should be played. And I doubt that anyone will ever play it as well as he did. And so that, my friends, is how I would fix the DC universe. Come at it with a plan and do not take the characters who work best as 1940s era characters out of that era. Allow them to be there. You know, show what they've grown into 70 years later, but allow them to operate primarily out of that period because that is the period they operate well best in. And we have the Justice League, all the way from the 1940s to the early 31st century that can springboard off of all kinds of stuff. We have the, uh, the Legion in the 31st century who can have their own adventures as science fictional stuff. We have the Green Lantern Corps running throughout all of that stuff. They can have their own adventures in space, science fiction, etc. Uh, Super Crew 63 says Batman from the 1880s would be cool, I think. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there was actually an Elseworlds graphic novel about that. Yeah. Um, you could do something like that. Just make it its own alternate universe. It's real simple. So we have all this stuff in place, but you got to have a plan, you know, and you can start on this relatively small with the big three in their own TV series because that's where they've always fared best. They have not worked that well on the big screen. They have always been better on a small screen. Start them out late 1930s into the 1940s. Make Wonder Woman just an outright World War II patriotic character, and Superman is around, and Batman started both of them in the, uh, in, on their release dates of the first comics and worked from there. Uh, Larry Larry says, don't hire Kathleen Kennedy to run it. Well, yes, obviously you need to hire me. Um, but I've just given it to you, DC. I have just given you how to fix your universe in the, in, in the films. Feel free to steal it. Although I would appreciate it if you'd call me because I think I can run this thing. As the Fandai Master, I know how to run these things. Uh, Larry says, uh, you agree wholeheartedly about Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah, I talked a little bit about, uh, about a half an hour ago about how she's been hired again. Okay, let me do a little bit of ad copy. <clears throat> Next time on Tales from SYL Ranch, the Fandai Master breaks the usual show format. Now, armed only with his phone, the Fandai Master will do impromptu live streams whenever the mood or the view comes to him. That's next week, next weekend, on Live from South Dakota on Tales from SYL Ranch. 
And, of course, Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch is live here uh, Mondays in North America, except this next weekend. It'll be whenever the hell I happen to put my camera on, on the tripod. At 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. And if you're working on UTC, that is 1 a.m. the following morning. Super Cruise 63, Bill, uh, Bill Stone for exec producer. You got my vote. Well, <laughs> don't think anybody's going to do that. They're going to be too busy worrying about how they can catch up to Marvel. My thing would be start small with the big three and work up from there. So. Uh, upcoming reviews I'm doing. Um, after the next weekend that I'm in, weekend from now that I'm in South Dakota, I'll be on October 15th, I'll be doing the first two episodes of the 13th Doctor, Jodie Whittaker, um, the first one of which is The Woman Who Fell to Earth, and the second one is The Ghost Moment Monument. I, I may, because I'll be watching the thing um, when I'm out at the ranch land, I may, after I watch it, um, do a live stream to pop in and say something about it. But the uh, formal review is scheduled for October 15th. Then, uh, October 22nd, as I mentioned, I'm going to be doing Hammer's 1958 Dracula. You can find this. I have not. I don't have a link for it today, so I'll have a link for it the week before. But you can find this by searching for Horror of Dracula on um, DailyMotion.com. It comes in two parts, but you can find it there real easily. Uh, then on Halloween, oh, I'm sorry, on October 29th, just in time for, ha for Halloween, I'll be doing the uh, review of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is another weird one for me to review. Then on Halloween itself, I'm going to do a live stream of the classic War of the Worlds 1938 broadcast. Uh, I realize it's probably too late. It's going to be 8 p.m. locally when that starts. Probably our trick-or-treaters will be gone by then. But I'll have something interesting to do. We can talk about the broadcast as it goes along. By the way, one thing I would mention to you that I will be talking about a lot on that show. That episode is, um, that, that broadcast is credited for something that never happened. There have been all kinds of people talking about it, all kinds of documentaries about how it panicked America. Never happened. So I'll talk about that. Uh, then November 5th, because one of my viewers uh, sent this to me, Jay Haley, sent me a copy. I will definitely be doing Predestination. I moved it around so that I could do nothing but uh, horror movies and the like for all of October because I thought it worked well. Uh, Larry, Larry says, Yagla, you know, another great live awesomeness. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Larry. Larry, uh, as we haven't said, I'll, I'll get to thanking in a second, but thank you. Yes. Uh, on November 12th, just in time for the holidays, November 12th, we'll do the 40th anniversary review of the Star Wars Holiday Special, abridged 45-minute watchable edition. Do have a link to that one below, I believe, it because you don't want to sit through the whole thing. It sucks. Um, unless you're a Star Wars fan, you really want it for some level of, uh, of completion. But other than that, stay away from the Star Wars Holiday Special. I can just tell you it's terrible. But the 45-minute uh, abridged version is at least a coherent um, at 45 minutes. Never be good, but it's coherent. Don't have anything scheduled after that until December 17th when I'll be reviewing in 1978's Superman, the movie, which is the best Superman movie ever made and will probably be the best Superman movie that will ever be made. Unless, of course, DC and the people at Warner Brothers hire me, in which case I will figure out another one that's just good or better. So I guess at this point I might ask something like this. Say, pardon me, but could you help out a fellow American who's down on his luck? Hit the road! Sess, yes, if you like what I'm doing, please like, sub, hit the notification bell, because I'm never quite sure if anybody's going to get notified if I do anything except for that. Tell all your friends, family, neighbors, and pets to do the same. Hit my PayPal tip jar, my Amazon, my merch store, I, I, and uh, the Amazon tip wish list. All of it goes to a laptop. And by the way, I need to thank all of my viewers, particularly the last guys that did uh, throw something in at the very tail end of the show. Uh, anything you send to me is going towards a new laptop. So, in the immortal words of Elvis Presley, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, do sell merch. It's not horrifyingly expensive. won't set you back too much. I uh, do sell t-shirts, tank tops, hoodies, coffee mugs, and stickers in a variety of sizes and colors. They all have the show logo on the front with the show motto, always know where your towel is. Then a YouTube channel name on the back. Um, that's probably going to change eventually because I have other plans that I've talked about. Although those are changing now because of some changes they're doing over at Real Dot Video. So I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do yet exactly. I'm still going to be on YouTube for the foreseeable future. Um, and on the back, they will have uh, some kind of logo or identification so that people know where you're watching, watching me. With the words, and nothing that you see in the press is real. 
nothing. And we can go all the way back to the 1938 broadcast of War of the Worlds to see how nothing that you see in the press is real. Nothing. So, I guess that that is all the time we have today, boys and girls. So tune in again on this coming weekend where I'm going to do impromptu live streams from the family ranch land, which you probably enjoy. In fact, uh, Jesse Milestone said she'd actually watch if I did that. So, Jesse was very kind to me on, a, on her. Uh, she was celebrating 15,000 um, subs uh, at Mindless Entertainment. And wow, she was really nice to me plugged me and allowed me to talk more in the stream than I probably should have, <laughs> but she let me do it. So thank you, Jesse, if you happen to be watching. So and until next week, this is Tales from SYL Ranch, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.